Hello, I'm Dr. Matty Kupel from Purdue University. Today's lecture will be part of the C.L. Davis Gross Morbid Anatomy of Diseases and will cover diseases of swine. Let's go to the first slide. In the past five years, this lecture has been given by Dr. Gregory Stevenson from Purdue University. He structured this lecture and developed the handout which should go with this lecture. He has been my mentor for the last five years and I am very grateful that he allowed me to continue in his footsteps. At the end of the handout, I also listed the number of, uh, a number of researchers that contributed slides to this lecture and I would like to acknowledge them here. Diseases of swine are rapidly evolving because the technology of swine management is rapidly changing. As recent as 10 years ago, a uh, large portion of swine were still reared outside. Farms at the size of 50 to 100 sows, and uh, we had groups ferret up to two, two, uh, two, per, two four per year, and pigs were weaned between four to eight weeks of age. Uh, modern farms have a size of 1,000 to 5,000 to 5, sows, and pigs are anywhere weaned between seven to 21 days of age. These units are environmentally controlled and use age-segregated and site-segregated management systems. Uh, All-in, all-out systems, uh, medicated early weaning, segregated early weaning, and two and three site productions are all examples of modern swine management. The changes in technology also have an impact on diseases. Pigs in these high health standard herds uh, are less exposed to pathogens. So we also have less opportunity for these pigs to develop immunity. Therefore, diseases which have been a problem in the past in an unsanitary environment are not a problem anymore. But other pathogens, which were not considered important, start to play a very important role in today's high health standard herds. Uh, so a couple of diseases I will cover during the next three hours uh, just made it into the literature during the last four to five years. Before we start to look at some of the diseases, I would like to familiarize you with the different ages uh, that go along with the different production stages. Suckling pigs are weaned anywhere from 7 to 21 days of age. I'm talking about modern swine production. Uh, they are then kept in a nursery for up to one to two months uh, per of age, and after that in a grower finishing phase uh, from three to six months of age. After that, pigs go to slaughter or are kept for breeding purposes. The average sow lives approximately five years of age and has two to 2.5 liters per year. So with this short of a lifespan, uh, we don't see many geriatric diseases. However, this, with the emergence of mini pigs as pets, especially in California, that might change in the near future. Just to show you an outline of the lecture, we will talk about neoplastic and congenital diseases first, and then focus on generalized diseases. Because a number uh, of these diseases cause lesions in multiple organs, I decided to focus on generalized diseases first. And when you are presented at the board with two slides at a time or ask for associated conditions, uh, you have an opportunity to remember uh, that certain diseases causing lesions in multiple organs. After that, we will break down diseases into each organ system and revisit some of these systemic diseases and compare them to diseases which cause more specific lesions in each organ system. Neoplasms, first condition I'm going to talk about. Because pigs only live for approximately five years, with this short of lifespan, neoplasms are rather rare in pigs. In fact, we only have one out of 33,000 pigs at slaughter found with a neoplasm. There are actually only three neoplasms you have to be really familiar with in pigs. First and most important one is malignant lymphoma. It affects all ages and sexes, and the multicentric and cymic form are the most common ones. This is a kidney with multifocal, well demarcated creamy to white nodules that are raised above the capsular surface and the diagnosis would be multifocal renal lymphoma. Another way how lymphoma might appear in the kidneys, the only differential I could think about is a pyelonephritis but that would be much more radiating from the pelvis. So even if you have problems to identify this lesion you uh, can see that there's involvement of the lymph nodes and as well as the <laughs> cream color uh, gives a correct morphological diagnosis away. So that would be a multifocal to coalescing renal lymphoma and don't forget to include the lymph nodes. 
This is a little bit more difficult slide, so just to orient you. This is the calvarium, here's cranial, there's caudal, and then we have the space occupying mass, uh, which is discolored in the mesencephalon, and we also have a mass here in the frontal sinuses. In other species, uh, there would be multiple differentials, but uh, na primary nervous neoplasm in pigs are very rare. So your top differential should still be lymphoma and then dissemination into the frontal sinuses. The last slide with lymphoma, a possible differential for this slide would include a multifocal granulomatose hepatitis caused by Mycobacterium avium. However, color, sharp demarcation uh, of the neoplastic nodules and the diffuse random distribution should all make you leaning toward lymphoma. Cutaneous melanomas tend to be heavily pigmented and are usually found in young pigs, especially in pigmented pigs like this Duroc. They are usually benign and they can be congenital, so pigs might actually get born with them. So this would be multiple cutaneous melanomas. Melanomas are, can rarely be malignant and metastasized, uh, like this one, into the thoracic vertebrae and actually into the spinal canal. Whenever you see a lesion like that, make sure that you include in your morphological diagnosis something like uh, focal myelomalacia or spinal cord atrophy. Nephroblastomas are commonly found in pigs younger than one year of age and are more common in females than they are in males. They are usually benign, but occasionally they can metastasize to liver and lungs. Uh, usually they represent themselves as single masses that are attached to the pole of a kidney and tend to be solitary and unilateral. This is a more characteristic cross-section. Nephroblastomas are often multiloculated and blood-filled and cystic, so <laughs> they kind of appear a little bit like a granulosa cell tumor on a horse. So even with the kidney missing in the slide, you should still come up with the correct answer of a nephroblastoma. Let's move on to congenital and hereditary conditions. Uh, in general, congenital diseases are rare in swine. I did not include genital abnormalities, even though pseudohem aphrodites are uh, quite common, or one of the more common conditions, uh, but this lecture uh, will, or these will be covered in Dr. Burgle's lecture. Uh, I would strongly advise all of you who are taking boards to read the first paragraphs in each chapter of uh, Jupp and Kennedy, which covers congenital abnormalities, to familiarize yourself with the correct nomenclature. The first condition I want to show you is relatively common. This is an inguinal or scrotal hernia. The femur head is here, has cranial, caudal, that's external oblique abdominal muscle, and here's the inguinal canal with intestines protruding through it. This condition is more common in male than female pigs and more often left than right. It tends to be unilateral. Boars and sows carry the trait, and storms of this condition can be associated with widespread use of semen from a boar that carries a defect. The lesion is con uh, considered to be caused by a weakness of the tunica vaginalis. If you see a slide like this, do not forget to include a possible vascular accident of the protruding intestines in your morphological diagnosis. So in this case, we have congestion and you can see this sharply demarcated area of small intestine, so vascular infarction. Umbilical hernias are less common than inguinal hernias and they can be congenital or can occur as a sequel to omphalitis. This condition is called splay leg or spreadle leg, but a more correct morphological diagnosis is myofibular hypoplasia of the deltoids and sem semi-tendinosis muscles. It commonly occurs in land rays. Pigs are born with myofibular hypoplasia. Uh, you see on your left the normal hind leg, and on the right a hind leg with uh, myofibular hypoplasia. Male pigs are more commonly susceptible, and one to four pigs per litter are affected. This condition is relatively common because uh, if pigs are able to suckle, they will survive uh, the first weeks of life and compensate uh, this lesion in a couple of weeks. This is a slide of arthrogryposis. This condition can be hereditary or it can be caused by in utero vitamin A or manganese deficiency, infection with classical swine fever virus, or exposure of a number of toxins like jimson weed, tobacco stalks, and I list a couple others in the handout. 
to the head of a pig and you can't tell whether that's micro or anophthalmia. It is caused uh, by in utero vitamin A deficiency. Other causes for this condition also include classical swine fever virus and it can also be inherited. A very rare condition but I kind of like this slide. These are conjoined twins or siamine twins and again it is very uncommon but it's a lethal condition that affects usually single pigs only. Another condition that's specific to pigs is congenital hyperostosis or con uh, it's also called congenital thick foreleg. This condition is characterized by the enlargement of the front legs. On cross section you can see that the long bones are actually normal but you have these spicules of trabecular bone that radiating from the periost. Uh, this condition is fatal in a couple of weeks. Multiple renal cysts are relatively common in pigs as in this kidney. They are mainly found at the pole of a kidney but they can, be can become coalescent and actually finally cause hydronephrosis as in this kidney. There's a high magnification of the abdominal skin of a sow showing you an inverted nipple. This is a fairly common condition and single inverted nipples are usually not of a greater concern. The old name for this condition is pituriasis rosea. If you remember the new and more correct name, you know the microscopic appearance and have a good morphological diagnosis. This is porcine, juvenile, postpastular, psoriasiform dermatitis. This is a higher magnification. There is a genetic predisposition in land race and lesions are usually found on the ventral abdomen. Uh, these are benign, self-limiting lesions of hyperkeratotic dermatitis that will have resolved before the grower finishing age. This is a pig with thrombocytopenia purpurea, which is a type 2 hypersensitivity caused by passive antiplatelet antibody transfer. Affected piglets die between one and three weeks of age of he uh, from hemorrhagic diathesis. Differentials for this lesion include bacterial septicemias, but we will talk about that later. Dermatosis vegetans is a very infrequent condition, and all pigs that carry this trait originated from one Danish landrace sow. Pigs are often born with a hyperkeratotic pododermatitis and have these thick papillomatose crusts along the legs and on the abdomen. A good morphological diagnosis would be multifocal to coalescing hyperkeratotic dermatitis. This condition is associated with a fatal giant cell pneumonia. On this slide of front leg you have a sharply demarcated area that lacks normal skin. So this is aplasia cutis uh, or epitheliogenesis imperfecta. This condition uh, may also affect the tongue and it can be associated with uh, concurrent hydroureter and hydronephrosis. Syndactyly has been reported in pigs, it has been polydactyly, but I only have a slide of the fused medium clause. Most of us seem to have difficulties to recognize lesions that are characterized by the lack of structures. So this is a slide where you can't see an anus. This is anal atresia, a condition that is more common in males than female pigs and fatal in two to three weeks. Another way to show this lesion would be an abdominal photograph with the pelvis open. So if you see at the board the megacolon at the hypoplastic rectum and somebody went through the trouble to open up the pelvis to show you the slide, make sure that you rule out anal atresia. Palatoschisis can occur in pigs as in other species and it's often associated with a teratogenic event in mid-gestation. This is a head of a pig with a rind in the cranium and the craniosciesis is associated with a meningoencephalocele. This lesion uh, occurs because of a neural tube defect secondary to an insult at day 12 to 14 of gestation. Uh, this is just another slide to help you better appreciate the craniosciesis. So don't forget to include craniosciesis in your morph from the previous slide. There's a heart with an interventricular septal defect and you hopefully can appreciate the probe that is sticking in it. Septal defects occur with some frequency and are more common in male than female pigs. The last slide was a congenital condition. It's a small intestine with persistent Meckel's diverticule. 
which is the residue of the omphalo mesenteric duct, also quite uncommon. Okay, let's now talk about generalized diseases. First, we will look at septicemias, and I will use Salmonella coracuus as an example because it's a fairly common cause of septicemias in swine. Then I will familiarize you with other causes of bacterial septicemia, such as Streptococcus, Haemophilus parasuus, Erysipelotrix, Rhusopathia, and Actinobacillus suus, and contrast these with Salmonella and each other. Some lesions of Salmonella coracuus can also easily be confused with foreign animal diseases, such as African swine fever or classical swine fever. I will point out lesions that help you differentiate these. However, without some of the differentiating lesions, bacterial septicemias and African swine fever and classical swine fever can be confused with each other. Salmonellosis uh, causes severe septicemia with or without concurrent pneumonia or enterocolitis in weaned and grower pigs. The disease is characterized by large amounts of endotoxins that activate cytokines and induce vascular damage and thrombosis. This is a group of sick pigs with congestion and cyanosis of the skin of the extremities due to a severe endotoxemia. Pigs can either die from the uh, acute endotoxemia or lesions resolve and become more chronic. This is the tip of a pinna with congestion, hyperemia, and marginal necrosis, uh, ischemic necrosis, secondary through thrombosis of muscular arteries and infarction of the overlying skin. That's quite characteristic for Salmonella coronavirus. Another characteristic lesion with Salmonella coronavirus is hemorrhagic interstitial pneumonia with this interlobular edema. Due to the vascular damage, the fluid in the interstitial might be blood tinct. And this is a higher magnification so that you can see the hemorrhagic interstitial edema. Differentials for this lesion include Streptococcus, Haemophilus, Parasuus, and highly virulent strain of uh, Pseudorabius virus can cause similar lesions. This is another slide of hemorrhagic interstitial pneumonia caused by Salmonella coracuus. In addition, there's also a separative bronchopneumonia, which you can see by these dark red consolidated craniovental lobes. Certainly, this bronchopneumonia could be caused by any concurrent lesion, but pigs often inhale large numbers uh, of Salmonella following replication and shedding, so you can have a truly secondary bronchopneumonia caused by an airborne salmonellosis. Hemorrhages are drained to the tributary lymph node, like here, this tracheobronchial lymph node. On high magnification of a lymph node, you can see a diffuse lymphadenitis with congestion, hemorrhages, and edema of an intact lymph node. Uh, differential for this lesion would be classical swine fever. In contrast, African swine fever would be characterized by much more diffuse necrosis. Okay, this is a ventral view of the heart palate, the soft palate, the larynx has been cut out, here are the molars, so there's cranial, there's caudal. Uh, the soft palate contains the tonsils, which have a fleshy appearance, and it has these crypts, which have the, are characterized by these little impressions down here. So these are multifocal, variable-sized, yellow crypt abscesses, with some of them actually having pass draining for them. Differentials for this lesion include Streptococcus suus and Archanobacterium pyogenes. This is a slide with mul uh, multiple morphological diagnosis. First, we have a cholecystitis, cholangitis, and you should appreciate the sickening of the wall of the gallbladder by edema. Secondly, we have lymphomegaly, characterized by this enlargement of the gastrohepatic lymph node. And for the ones of you who have really good eyes, there are some focal areas of multifocal hepatic necrosis. Multifocal hepatic necrosis is a fairly consistent lesion with Salmonella. You should be able to identify this tissue as liver because of the very obvious lobulation here, very characteristic lobulation. These are multifocal areas of necrosis. Necrotic foci are kind of white, yellowish, and randomly distributed throughout the parenchyma. There's a cross-section of a multifocal necrotizing hepatitis. I prefer to call it a hepatitis because uh, these little nodules, which are also referred to as parathyroid nodules, there's first, microscopically, there's first necrosis of hepatocytes, which is then replaced uh, by hemorrhages and fibrin, and finally aggregates of macrophages 
and neutrophils. This inflammatory component uh, contrasts this lesion to pseudorabies virus where you wouldn't have the inflammatory component in it. So the best morphological diagnosis would be a necrotizing hepatitis. Splenomegaly is another lesion that can be found with bacterial septicemias. In infection with uh, salmonella, we can see enlarged spleens, which are kind of purple, reddish, and that's due to engorged blood and fibrin. Infarcts uh, are very, very rare with salmonellosis, and that contrasted this lesion to the classical swine fever. This is what you might remember from uh, veterinary school as a turkey egg kidney. These are multifocal renal petechia and ecchymosis, and the glomeruli are filled with blood and fibrin. So a good morphological diagnosis would be diffuse fibrinohemorrhagic glomerulonephritis. Differentials include classical swine fever, African swine fever, erysipelas, and porcine dermatitis nephropathy syndrome. Salmonella can also cause a severe diffuse separative leptomeningitis, but this is relatively uncommon. Such a lesion would be much more common with uh, streptococcus suus or haemophilus parasuus. Occasionally, we see infections with Salmonella coronavirus uh, causing this focally hemorrhagic gastritis, fibrohemorrhagic gastritis. This lesion is rather unique uh, to Salmonella, and it's probably caused by venous infarction. When looking at a pig stomach, you should get used to identifying the area where you have the lesion. So these high mucosal folds should help you identify this, lesion, uh, this area as fundus. Salmonella can also cause a severe diffuse fibrinonecrotic enterocolitis. In the small intestine, the lesion tends to be more pseudomembranous, whereas in the large intestine, uh, we have these areas, abscesses of lymphoglandular complexes, which gives it a more multifocal appearance. If this lesion becomes more chronic, these areas will resemble button ulcers, and we will talk about this in a moment. The top differential, however, for this type of enteritis would be Salmonella typhimurium. So if you don't have other slides going along with it, your top differential should be Salmonella typhimurium. This is a spiral colon with a diffuse fibrinous colitis with multifocal hemorrhages. You should be able to identify this as a colon because of the circumferential folds. And as mentioned before, Salmonella coronavirus can also call, cause a severe chronic multifocal fibrinonecrotic uh, ulcerative colitis. So these are button ulcers. Uh, they are caused by ischemic necrosis, secondary to a vasculitis. Differentials for this lesion include classical swine fever, Salmonella coronavirus, Salmonella typhimurium, and as a very rare isolate, Salmonella typhisuus. Okay, let's go on to Haemophilus parasuus. Hemophilus parasuus can also cause an acute septicemia that resembles septicemic salmonellosis. More commonly, it causes, however, polycirrhositis, or polyarthritis, and meningitis, which is also referred to as Glasser's disease, and it primarily occurs in veined pigs. It also causes eustachitis and a temporary otitis media. This is a pig which died with a Hemophilus parasuus septicemia, and you can see the cutaneous cyanosis and ischemic necrosis. Haemophilus parasuus can also cause a diffuse hemorrhagic pneumonia and similar to salmonellosis. However, we have a severe fibrinous epicarditis and pericarditis, and the top differential for this lesion should be Haemophilus parasuus or Streptococcus suus. The section of intestine with multifocal serosal hemorrhages, which are second caused by Haemophilus parasuus, secondary to a systemic vasculitis. And septicemic hemophilus parasuus can also cause a fibrinopurulent glomerulonephritis. And as with salmonella, the glomeruli are filled with fibrin and blood. And the brain with a fibrinous leptomeningitis. Neurological clinical signs are very uncommon in pigs with glasses disease. Occasionally, hemophilus parasuus can cause acute outbreaks of highly fatal fibrinous subdurative leptomeningitis in young adult replacement breeding stock shortly after the entry into the recipient herd. 
Uh, septicemia is caused by Haemophilus parasus can resemble septicemic salmonellosis. In contrast, uh, fibrinous polycyositis, as you can see it here, is not caused by Salmonella coracus. In suckling pigs, the most common differential is Streptococcus suis. Uh, e. coli can cause uh, sporadic uh, polycyositis, especially in pigs that are deprived of colostrum. In wean pigs, differentials include Haemophilus parasus, Streptococcus suis, and Mycoplasma hyorhinus. Also, all three can cause uh, meningitis in wean pigs. Clinical CNS disease is only commonly seen with Streptococcus. Streptococcus suis can also cause septicemia with or without a fibrinous polycyrositis or leptomeningitis. And when the fibrinous polycyrositis predominates with Streptococcus, it is quite difficult to differentiate from Glathas disease. In general, the amount of fibrin and the severity of the peritonitis are greater with Glathas disease then they are with streptococcus. So this is a pig with severe diffuse, uh, fibr diffuse fibrinous polycyrositis, which was caused by Haemophilus parasus. Another slide from a pig with glathas disease with a diffuse fibrinous pericarditis, epicarditis, and pleuritis. Again, this lesion could be caused by any of the three, Haemophilus parasus, streptococcus suus, mycoplasma hyorhinus. Often we find in pigs uh, with a pleuritis, a concurrent bronchopneumonia and atelectasis, and that can be caused by any bacterial pathogen causing bronchopneumonia. We'll talk about that later. The so polycyrositis uh, often occurs with a concurrent fibrinopurulent arthritis. The probe helps you to identify the large amounts of fibrin. Uh, if you would be presented with a slide only like that, Differentials would also include mycoplasma hyacinovia and erysipelas. When pigs survive the acute phase of the disease, you can see more chronic lesion as demonstrated with by these fibrous adhesions between the parietal pleura and the lungs. Okay, let's move on to streptococcus suis. There are now 35 capsular serotypes described in pigs. It's the most common uh, streptococcus is most common in suckling and recently weaned pigs, but it can occur in any age. The fibrinopurulent leptomeningitis, as in this slide, uh, is quite common, and you can often see, as I mentioned before, clinical signs and high mortality, clinical CNS signs and high mortality with it. Uh, and it also, streptococcus can also cause lichemophilus parasuus, fatal outbreaks of leptomeningitis in young replacement breeding swine shortly after the introduction into a recipient herd. Streptococcus suis can cause a severe diffuse fibrinous pericarditis, epicarditis, and pleuritis, which you really can't differentiate from Haemophilus uh, parasuris glasses disease. And you really can't differentiate in this case because I showed you exactly the same plaque as I showed you before, just a different view of it. This is a slide, another slide, again, with a fibrinous epicarditis and pleuritis. Uh, usually we only see a mild interstitial pneumonia with streptococcus suis. In this case, we have a very severe diffuse interstitial pneumonia that was caused by porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus, PERS. Streptococcus suis has assumed greater responsibility or importance, uh, not responsibility, importance since PERS virus has become ubiquitous in swine population. Acute PERS predisposes pigs uh, to streptococcus suis induced septicemia. Streptococcus suis can also cause uh, fibrinopurulent arthritis, in this case in a carpal joint, similar to Haemophilus parasuis. A lesion that we haven't talked about so far that can be caused by streptococcus suis is a vegetative valvular endocarditis. In pigs, this condition tends to be uh, more commonly caused by bacterial septicemias and Differentials include actinobacillus suis and erysipelas, and the AV valves, for that reason, seem to be more commonly involved. Streptococcus suis septicemia can also cause multifocal thrombosis of cutaneous arteries, leading to these cutaneous macules. However, my top differentials for a lesion like that would be certainly erysipelas or actinobacillus suis. Just for completeness of fibrinous uh, polycyrositis, this is a fibrinous epicarditis, pericarditis caused by mycoplasma hyorhinus. 
Mycoplasma hyorhinus is a common commensal of the upper and lower respiratory tract of wean pigs, and it's a very uncommon cause of polycerositis, and lesions are usually limited to the thorax. And as a last differential of polycerositis, uh, this is a severe purulent meningitis caused by E. coli. E. coli is uh, ubiquitous in the fecal flora. It has to be considered as an opportunistic cause of septicemia with or without the polycerositis. And we see it especially in colostrum deprived pigs. Fibrin is typically abundant and the exudate can be sometimes fibrinopurulent. Okay, let's move on to erysipelas. It's a classical disease of swine that is rarely seen in modern production units but still occurs uh, primarily in environmentally uh, regulated buildings. Erysipelas rusipatiae causes disease in all ages. The mortality is highest when lesions are most extensive and severe in suckling and recently weaned pigs. Growing and finishing pigs may be found dead with only a few gross lesions and sometimes lameness may predominate. The most characteristic lesion of erysipelas are these multifocal cutaneous diamond-shaped or rhomboid infarcts. With a higher magnification of a typical rhomboid infarct in the skin. Uh, ischemic necrosis secondary to vasculitis can also cause lesions in the snout. And it can also affect the coronary band. So we can have necrosis of the coronary band. And this a uh, typical differential for this lesion would be other bacterial septicemia, especially Salmonella corazuas. Splenomegaly is very commonly found with erysipelas, and typically spleens are two times normal size. Uh, they are red, but in contrast to Salmonellosis, they have this meaty, firm consistency, mm, and that's due to lymphoid follicular hyperplasia. Erysipelas also causes acute purulent arthritis and periarticular edema. And again, differentials would include mycoplasma hyacinovia and all the cause of polycerositis I listed before. As the lesion becomes more chronic, we can see this proliferative synovitis, and a good differential for that would be still mycoplasma hyacinovia. With that, we move on to actinobacillus suis. Actinobacillus suis causes uh, sporadic outbreaks of fulminant embolic septicemia in all ages of pigs. In suckling and recently weaned pigs, it often causes acute death, whereas in finishing age pigs, uh, most pigs are also found dead, but the primary problem is respiratory disease. In adult pigs, uh, disease is less often fatal and it more commonly resembles erysipelas. This is an example of rhomboid cutaneous infarcts, which are caused by Actinobacillus suis. As I stated before, uh, they very closely resemble erysipelas, and probably when presented with this slide at the boards, my top differential would be erysipelas. The most characteristic lesion of uh, A. suis is this embolic fibrinonecrotic pneumonia. Affected areas of necrosis, hemorrhage, and uh, fiber deposition are multifocal distributed, suggesting a hematogenous origin. And if these lesions uh, coalesce, they might very closely resemble or actually be identical to uh, actinobacillus pneumoniae APP. However, the septicemic lesions of A. suis differ from APP. And this is a kidney from a pig with actinobacillus suis. And it's characterized by these multifocal renal cortical petechia and ecchymosis due to an embolic nephritis. You can also find the fibrinous epicarditis and pericarditis with A. suis, and differentials would primarily for this slide would include Streptococcus suis, Mycoplasma hyorhinus, and Haemophilus parasuus. The corda tendinae on this slide should help identifying uh, it at heart. So that's the vegetative valvular endocarditis, which can be caused by A. suis. And as I mentioned before, Streptococcus suis would be the top differential, also erysipelas. Rusiopathia can cause similar lesions, and then, uh, furthermore, E. coli, Arcanobacterium pyogenes, and Streptococcus equisimilis. With that, we go to Arcanobacterium pyogenes. That's a very common isolate from swine. It usually it's an environmentally contaminant of wounds, and it's causing a localized purulent infection that is followed by bacteremia, which results then 
in disseminated abscesses. It's also a very common opportunistic secondary pulmonary pathogen. And this is an example of a diffuse embolic abscessing pneumonia. Abscesses can be found in all organs, like these ones in the myocardium. And actino Arcanobacterium uh, pyogenes also causes uh, vegetative valvular endocarditis, as I mentioned before. And that would affect both uh, mitral and aortic valves. This is the liver with multifocal abscesses randomly distributed throughout the parenchyma. Color and shape uh, should not make you, uh, having you making the mistake to call that lymphoma or granulomatous hepatitis caused by Mycobacterium avium. Another example of a septicemia caused by a pyogenes that's a multifocal embolic nephritis with multiple cortical infarcts. This lesion can also be caused by E. coli. Uh, by the way, you probably already noticed I uh, slipped the tongue a couple of times. If you use an older but uh, correct terminology and call the cause of this lesion uh, Arcanobacterium pyogenes uh, or Actinomyces pyogenes or Carinobacterium pyogenes, you will receive full credit at the board. So any of these names would give you full credit. Uh, apiogenes can also cause abscess in the brain, which might sometimes be a little bit difficult to distinguish if they are not raised above the cortex. And it can also cause abscesses like here in the mandible, which is probably secondary to infection uh, uh, of the gingiva following clipping of the teeth. Okay, after we talked about bacterial septicemias, let's now focus on some generalized viral diseases and more recently described syndromes. Porcine dermatitis and nephropathy syndrome is one of the more recently described syndromes. The underlying lesion is a segmental necrotizing vasculitis with or without thrombosis, and it affects primarily medium-sized muscular arteries. Therefore, this disease has also been called systemic necrotizing vasculitis and glomerulonephritis. The cause is unknown. Recently, PERS and PERS and Circovirus type 2 have been suggested as causes via an immune-mediated vasculitis, but that's unproven so far. The characteristic lesion are multifocal cutaneous infarcts that are distributed over the flanks, the ears, and along the legs. So the distribution is very characteristic for PDNS. That's a higher magnification of these infarcts, and they can be poorly or very well defined, or they can become coalescent. The second part of uh, post dermatitis nephropathy syndrome is uh, severe glomerulonephritis and necrotizing vasculitis of the kidney, and you can see this diffuse petechiation of the renal cortex. With that, we go to pseudorabies. Pseudorabies, or Odetsky's disease, is caused by porcine herpes virus. The clinical signs and lesions vary according to age. In suckling pigs, uh, the mortality is high and is associated with clinical nervous signs and multifocal necrosis in the parenchyma of multiple organs. In nursery growing and older pigs, uh, the mortality is lower and is associated with respiratory disease. CNS signs in these pigs are less common, but microscopic lesions in the CNS are common. Late-term abortions occur uh, occasionally in episodics. This slide shows you a group of suckling pigs uh, with tremors. Some have head tilts, ataxia, and sternal recumbency. And this is caused by a non separative meningoencephalitis uh, caused by the rabies virus. Tonsillar hemorrhages are commonly found in pigs with the rabies virus, and the top differential would be classical swine fever. One of the most characteristic lesions, and I will show you a better slide of this when we talk about classical swine fever, is tonsillar necrosis. So in contrast to bacterial septicemias like salmonellosis, we have now tonsillar necrosis. These are not abscesses. Then multifocal hepatic necrosis, as I mentioned before, when we talked about salmonella, is one of the relatively common lesions seen with uh, pseudorabies virus. And microscopically, you can differentiate these lesions because these are not parathyroid nodules, but true areas of coagulative necrosis. However, grossly, I really don't think you can tell salmonella from pseudorabies. Uh, sometimes we also have a multifocal vesicular ulcerative nasal dermatitis that can be differentiated or should be differentiated 
from a number of vesicular disease, and we will talk about that later with skin. An occasion per uh, pseudorabies virus can also cause a diffuse fibrinonecrotic rhinitis. You can see here, there's also fibrin in the larynx. And this is a trachea which has been opened, and again, it is filled with fibrin. So we have a fibrinonecrotic laryngotracheitis. Also, that's not very commonly seen in pigs uh, affected by a pseudorabies virus. You should always come up with this lesion as being caused by herpes virus because it's so similar to IBR and cattle. As mentioned before, highly virulent strains of pseudorabies virus can cause an interstitial hemorrhagic pneumonia. Okay, with that we go to Perth. One of the currently most important diseases in swine industry is porcine reproductive, uh, respiratory and, and reproductive syndrome, which is caused by Perth virus and artery virus. Consistent gross and microscopic lesions are only found in the lungs and lymph nodes. Frequently, microscopic lesions can be found in the heart and also in the brain. The alveolar macrophages are the target cells for uh, Perth virus infection. And uh, infection of pigs as a post-weaning age especially can be very long-standing and can cause significant economic losses. This is just a pig with cutaneous hyperemia and the position indicates the position it's standing in that it's in respiratory distress. The majority of field strains of PERS cause only a very mild interstitial pneumonia. So this lung is non-collapsed and has these gray to 10 uh, areas. If you would show me this lung, it rather appears like a normal lung. So the only good differential or the only morphological diagnosis you can come up with is uh, interstitial, mild interstitial pneumonia uh, with atelectasis uh, and pulmonary edema. This is a much more characteristic lesion of a severe interstitial pneumonia caused by a PERS virus infection. Uh, the parenchyma is mottled red partially diffusely red, and it is very heavy, it's edematous, it's non-collapsed, has kind of a rubbery consistency. The characteristic microscopic lesion that goes along with this uh, lesion is an interstitial pneumonia with pycnotic macrophages in the alveoli, and again, that's very typical of a purse lung. These are the iliac lymph nodes, and as you can see, I just want to show you here the nodular lymphoid hyperplasia. These lymph nodes can be up to 10 times normal size. And the nodular hyperplasia is characteristic for PERS. Microscopically, uh, there's lymphoid necrosis then followed by this lymphoid hyperplasia. There have been syncytial cells described with PERS, but I think these are much more commonly seen or most likely caused by porcine circovirus type 2. Okay, and just a high magnification of some lymph nodes to show you this typical nodular lymphoid hyperplasia. This is a historic slide, so it helps you to understand why Perth was also called Abortus Blue in South. South not only aborted, but had this quite remarkable cutaneous cyanosis, especially of the ears and snouts, secondary to respiratory disease. Perth is also a very important cause of reproductive failure and abortion. It can be transmitted with semen and can affect embryos and cause early embryonic death. This is a slide of stillborn fetuses. Some are fresh, some have sterile autolysis. This is a non-specific finding, and in fact, uh, abortions, uh, most of the abortions have non-infectious causes. However, I wanted you to notice the inconsistent but very characteristic lesion of abortions caused by uh, uh, sorry, PERS virus. It causes a necrotizing vasculitis of the umbilical artery with umbilical edema and hemorrhages. Certainly my favorite disease to talk about is post-weaning multisystemic wasting syndrome, PMWS. It causes wasting and sometimes ictus in 5 to 15 percent of weaned pigs. It's associated with porcine circovirus type 2. Uh, and uh, the disease has been reproduced by a combined infection with PCV2 and porcine parvovirus, and more recently uh, with PCV2 alone following administration of keyhole limpid hemocyanin and incomplete freund adjuvants. Porcine circovirus uh, has also been associated with transplacental infection of fetuses that were aborted and had uh, myocardial lesions, and also with congenital tremors type A2. 
So this is an interstitial pneumonia, which is a very common finding in pigs with PMWS. And I like to use this slide because it originates from uh, one of the first cases described by Ted Clark in Canada. There's a higher magnification of interstitial pneumonia with lobular atelectasis caused by porcine circovirus from a pig with PMWS. The most characteristic lesions in pigs with PMWS is lymphadenopathy. In this case, we have a colonic lymph node. Here's intestine. Uh, if you would show me this slide, one of my top differentials uh, would be a PMWS. However, as I just showed you with PERS, certainly lymphoid hyperplasia can be caused by other diseases. Uh, the histologically, the characteristic lesion would be diffuse granulomatose inflammation with uh, very characteristic intracytoplasmic uh, inclusion bodies in the, in the cytoplasm of macrophages. Here's another slide to show you generalized lymphadenopathy, some sublingual, retropharyngeal, and parodic lymph nodes, which are all enlarged, sometimes up to four times normal size. And as I stated before, characteristic uh, microscopic lesion would be granulomatose lymphadenitis. Less consistent lesion of PMWS includes an interstitial nephritis. You can see on top of the slide the normal kidney, and in contrast to it, uh, renomegaly, which is caused by diffuse interstitial nephritis. And histologically, you would find granulomatous inflammation expanding the interstitium in these kidneys, and this lesion can help you differentiate it from PERS. Liver lesions are the most likely cause of icterus and wasting. That's the liver with diffuse hepatic necrosis and atrophy, and the yellow discoloration also uh, helps you identifying this as necrosis and loss of parenchyma. And again, it helps you to differentiate this lesion from this uh, PERS. Well, this lesion helps you differentiate PMWS from PERS. The easiest way of showing icterus in a pig is to show you the serum. You probably can appreciate how yellow the serum is, so that was from an ecteric pig with PMWS. The last two generalized diseases I want to talk about are foreign animal diseases. Classical swine fever, also called hog collar or European swine fever, is caused by a pestivirus. It is not currently in North America, but it's in Europe. In recent outbreaks, the classical acute virulent form of classical swine fever with severe diarrhea, that's why it's called hog collar, convulsions and deaths occurred rarely, and the subacute form with low mortality and few gross lesions was much more common. Conjunctivitis, as you can see here in this pig, is uh, caused as one of the more classic lesions and is caused by a generalized segmental necrotizing vasculitis. Differentials for that include uh, chlamydia suis and also porcine paramyxovirus that causes blue eye disease. Blue eye disease is not in the US, but it's in Mexico. And it's characterized by conjunctivitis, encephalitis, pneumonia, and reproductive failure. Button ulcers in the colon are another classic lesion with uh, classical swine fever. And as I mentioned before, top differentials in the US include Salmonella typhimurium, followed by Salmonella corazuis, and as a rare isolate, Salmonella typhisuis. Multifocal renal cortical petechia, as seen with Salmonella corazuis, can also be found in pigs with classical swine fever. And they are secondary to necrotizing vasculitis. We can also have peripheral hemorrhagic lymphadenitis. And this slide shows you a lymph node which looks exactly like the lymph node I showed you before with salmonellosis. This is another slide of multifocal tonsillar necrosis. And now you can understand why I wanted to really differentiate you this lesion from salmonellosis. These are not abscesses. That's multifocal tonsillar necrosis. And the two top differentials for this lesion include classical swine fever and pseudorabies virus. Multifocal splenic infarcts, actually diffuse multifocal splenic infarcts, that's one of the classical hallmark lesions of classical swine fever. Aperitozoonosis can cause sometimes infarcts, and very, very rarely salmonellosis can cause also splenic infarcts. 
A reproductive form of classical swine fever exists also, and it's characterized by mummified uh, stillborn and weakborn pigs, congenital tremors, cerebellar hypo and aplasia, limb deformation, arteriosclerosis can all be caused by classical swine fever. The cerebellar aplasia, as in this slide, you can see it here, is one of the hallmark lesions of classical swine fever, and it's typical for pesky viruses like BVD in cattle. This is a slide of fresh and outlyzed fetuses. Uh, this is just a slide to remind me that abortions are one of the most frequent findings seen with recent outbreaks of classical swine fever. Uh, this slide doesn't actually have anything to do with classical swine fever, but as I mentioned before, most of the causes of abortion are truly not infectious. There are multiple viral causes of abortions, and uh, most of them are not associated with specific lesions. The few which are, I will show you later when we talk about the urogenital system. The next slides are from a recent outbreak of classical swine fever in northern Germany. The lesions have been very mild, difficult to distinguish from bacterial septicemias. So laryngeal hemorrhages, as you can see here, are one of the more consistent findings, or were one of the more consistent findings. Splenic infarcts were only very rarely found, and only single infarcts, it's very often localized, could be identified. On occasion, we had a diffuse necrohemorrhagic colitis. And very commonly, multifocal cirrhosis hemorrhages, as you can see here in the stomach or in the bladder, were seen in these pigs. Abortions without other any lesions were also very commonly found in recent outbreaks of classical swine fever in Europe. African swine fever is another foreign animal disease and also currently not in North America. It is caused by an unclassified DNA virus and soft ticks function as a reservoir and vector, ornithodorus ticks. However, transmission is mainly, as with classical swine fever, from feeding uncooked pork or through carrier pigs. The acute form is characterized by high fever, terminal bloody diarrhea and death. The subacute form is less fatal with uh, hemorrhagic lymph nodes, spleens and kidneys. In the chronic form, we often find lymphoid hyperplasia, pruritus, pericarditis, and pneumonia. I will only focus on the classic lesions. This is an example of renal cortical petechia and ecchymosis. The diffusely hemorrhagic and necrotic lymph nodes uh, might make that slide uh, suspicious for African swine fever, but these lesions could be caused by any of the bacterial septicemias uh, I showed you previously or porcine dermatitis nephropathy. This is a kidney with multifocal coalescing renal cortical and also medullary hemorrhages. Hemorrhages are more diffuse and deeper in the cortex with, than with classical swine fever and salmonellosis. The lymph nodes you can see here are often black from hemorrhages. They are friable from diffuse necrosis and that really contrasts to the marbled appearance as we have seen it with salmonella or classical swine fever. The spleens can also be necrotic. And this is thorax uh, with uh, pericardial sac opened to show you hydropericardium. African swine fever uh, and replicates in endothelial cells, and this lesion is thought to be the cause of vascular leakage. And bloody diarrhea is one of the terminal events with uh, African swine fever due to or caused by DIC and thrombocytopenia. I will show you much more common cause of bloody diarrhea when we talk about gastro. We continue our lecture with gastrointestinal diseases. The first condition occurs in the oral cavity of small pigs. Pigs are born with long sharp teeth in the front of their mouth and these are called milk or needle teeth. They are used uh, pigs use these to create a competitive advantage for themselves when nursing. So the manager has clipped them off with very sharp instruments uh, to avoid skin lacerations. If they are not careful, they actually end up with causing lacerations to the gums and lips, and these can become secondary infected by bacteria. So in this case, we have a multifocal, fibronecrotic, and ulcerative, and then depending where you are, you want to use the most specific uh, locator of the lesion, so it could be either gingivitis, stomatitis, or chelitis, uh, depending which one applies. This is another rare condition in pigs. 
we have here the front incisors, the lips, and there's the lower portion of the tongue. And so this is a necroulcerative gingivitis and stomatitis, which actually was caused by a T2 toxin. T2 toxin is closely related to DON, vomitotoxin, and DAS, which are all mycotoxins. And they are not usually an important cause of lesions because they are potent feed refusals. So pigs really don't like the taste of them. Uh, T2 toxin is luckily the least common of the three, uh, but it's the most important in terms of causing disease because it's the least potent feed feed refusal factor, and it also causes dermal necrosis. Generally, the lesions are limited to the mouth, but because pigs quit eating uh, due to the pain and the taste. However, if they continue uh, to eat the T2 toxin, then you can actually find necrosis throughout the whole GI tract. Another differential for uh, necrotizing gingivitis would be just chemical burns. That's another uncommon lesion is in the tongue uh, with a focally extensive ulcerative glossitis. And this lesion is seen in about one third of animals affected with exudative epidermitis caused by Staphylococcus hyacus. I did not include this lesion to show you a tongue sticking out, but instead a multifocal vesicular glossitis. This one was actually caused by foot and mouse disease virus. That's an after virus, which is of special importance, as we all know, in, right in Great Britain right now. Differentials for this lesion include other vesicular diseases, uh, and we will talk about that later when we talk about skin diseases. On the bottom of the slide, you have a normal esophagus. esophagus. On the top, you have an esophagus, uh, which has this yellow pseudomembrane. So this is thrush or esophageal candidiasis. The best morphological diagnosis would be a diffuse pseudo pseudomembranous esophagitis. The pseudomembranes consist of mats of mycelia, bacteria, and which are overgrown in there, and hyperkeratotic material. So it's not really fibronecrotic material. Candida albicans can also cause this diffuse pseudomembranous gastritis, and the lesion often is a sequel to long-term use of antibiotics, as we can see it in other species. Okay, alterations of the past esophagia uh, are a very important and costly problem in the swine industry. As I mentioned before, you should get into the habit of specifying the location of lesions, and especially ulcers in the stomach of pigs. And these ulcers are quite different than pyloric ulcers in the stomach of primates or humans. The past esophagia in pigs is lined by squamous epithelium. And risk factors for these ulcers include the gender, barrows are more commonly affected, uh, genotype, season, you find it more commonly in the summer and hot summers. And uh, finally, grinded food uh, is another risk factor. Also, anorexia often caused by concurrent diseases. Uh, Gastrospirillium species, now Helicobacter hymeni, had been uh, implicated in these lesions. However, in recent inoculation studies, uh, no effect was demonstrated, but instead uh, the feeding of fermentative commensal bacteria with a high carbohydrate diet caused uh, alteration of the past esophagia. The only clinical sign you often see in pigs with gastric ulcers is anemia. That's called bleach outs often in swine industry, and pigs may die so quickly that uh, you have no clinical signs developing. Here you have a blood clot in the stomach uh, to help you look for a cause of gastric bleeding. Otherwise, it would be very easy to overlook the ulcer. This is the uh, esophagus, and uh, the mucosa of the past esophagia should have the same white color. But uh, you can see here we have complete ulceration and hemorrhages. Often, you also can find blood in the intestine, like here in the large intestine spiral colon. Uh, it is very easy to confuse the melena with the hemorrhagic uh, uh, enteritis, and you should look very carefully at the mucosa and the quality of the blood to differentiate melena from hemorrhagic enteritis. There's a higher magnification of an ulcer of the past esophagia, and as you can see, the edges are walled off, and the lesion is covered with hemorrhages and fibrin. And over esophageal perforation, 
uh, necrotizing esophagitis is an unusual lesion which can be associated with a gastric ulcer and this was caused by a gastroesophageal reflux of acid secondary to uh, ulceration of the past esophagia of the stomach. This is an uncommon lesion in the stomach. As you can see, the past esophagia is white and appears relatively normal. The stomach was cut open at the greater curvature and we find here in the fundus these large areas of gastric ulcers. So that's why it's important to really recognize the area where ulcers are located. And this was most likely uh, caused by salmonella secondary to venous infarction. The other differential for this lesion would be stomach worms, hyostrongulus rubidus. And these are stomach worms, hyostrongulus rubidus, which you can see here on the mucosa. Uh, the, gastro uh, the etiologic diagnosis for this lesion would be gastric nematodiasis. The worms require seven days of incubation from X to L3 larvae on pastures to be infective. So in today's high health swine industry, we very rarely see infection with hyostrongulus rubidus. This is a slide you probably won't see on the boards. It's an example of gastric anisarchiasis causing a focal ulcerative gastritis. The slide originated from an outbreak in Germany following the feeding of fish meal to pigs. Multiple fish species are intermediate host and similar lesions can be seen in men making pigs a possible human model. Okay, on the boards you probably won't find the diagnosis listed on top of the slide. You should appreciate the tremendous dilatation of the stomach from this pig. This lesion was caused by degeneration of the intramural ganglia through an infection with the coronavirus. This is vomiting and wasting disease caused by hemagglutinating encephalomyelitis virus. This virus also causes a non separative encephalomyelitis. Let's move on to the intestine. This is a normal small intestine of a suckling pig. Pigs suckle every hour, so the stomach should always contain milk. Uh, the lymphatics of the proximal half of uh, the intestine are therefore always filled with uh, chyle. I want to look at E. coli a little bit more in detail because the mechanisms of colibacillosis in pigs are very well worked out. First, let's talk about endotoxigenic E. coli. It causes hypersecretory diarrhea in suckling pigs or nursery age pigs. It is caused by hemolytic or non-hemolytic strains that colonize the small intestine uh, by way, and they only they colonize the small intestine only uh, by way of fimbria. These fimbria are K88, K99, 987P, and F41 in suckling pigs, and K88 and F18AC in weaned pigs. Uh, these E. coli uh, secrete endotoxins which are either heat-deliable toxins that are found in suckling pigs only or heat-stable endotoxins. And both of these endotoxins cause a secretory diarrhea by different mechanisms. The LT toxin activates adenylate cyclase that increases CAMP in the cytoplasm of endocytes. And the ST toxin activates guanylate cyclase that increases GMP, which inhibits the sodium chloride uh, co-transport system. The other type of E. coli that causes diarrhea is enteropathogenic E. coli or attaching effacing E. coli, that's the same thing. It is uncommon and causes disease in one to six week old pigs. It only colonizes the dis distal portion of the ileum, but it's much more common in the cecum and in the colon. They do not colonize by fimbria, but attach uh, by an EAE gene product. Uh, this EE gene product is a 94 kilodalton protein and it's also called intamine. They are verotoxin negative and they cause disease by colonization and degeneration of villous enterocytes, giving the classical attaching and effacing lesion. That's also called cobblestone appearance, which you can see microscopically. Grossly, you can't tell these two diseases apart and they're only few pathological changes associated with E. coli infection. This is an example of a diffuse cataral enteritis. The small intestine is congested, flaccid, and distended with fluid. 
Here we have the small intestine open so that you can see the homogeneous fluid content and also the hyperemic mucosa. In cases of an endotoxigenic E. coli disease, uh, we might have a complication by shock with characteristic lesions of marked congestion of the small intestine, uh, especially the walls, and also blood tinged intestinal content. So that's only a very mild hemorrhagic enteritis. Several viruses have a tropism for mature enterocytes and cause destruction that results in villous atrophy and also decreased absorption and digestion. The severity of the clinical signs varies depending on the area of the intestine infected and the part of the villi that is destroyed. Uh, TGE virus is a coronavirus, and it's the most important cause of atrophic enteritis and in pigs affecting all ages and it causes destruction of endocytes along the whole length of the villi. The rotavirus infections are widespread, but uh, they often are only subclinic. Uh, they are found predominantly in two to six week old pigs, especially when the maternal an uh, immunity decreases uh, and they only affect the tip of the, the villi, the only endocytes on the tip of the villi. An important differential for these two viral uh, atrophic enteritis uh, is coccidiosis caused by Isospora suis, and we will find the different developmental stages of the coccidia that destroy androcytes causing an atrophic enteritis in suckling pigs between one to two weeks of age. Less likely differentials include an astrovirus, parvovirus, pores and enteric calicivirus, and chlamydia suis. This is an example of a pig with severe, watery, yellow diarrhea, typical of TGE, resulting in cachexia and dehydration. Uh, the TGE virus causes severe atrophic enteritis uh, that causes a decreased absorption and digestion. And as a result, you will find uncurled, uh, you will find curled, undigested uh, milk in the stomach and in the small intestine. And the lymphatics, as you can see here, will lack child. So that's the only thing which helps you differentiate that from a normal intestine. The severe atrophy of the villi causes the wall of the intestine to become very thin, almost translucent, and you can also see undigested intestinal content. As I mentioned before, the other differential for entrophic enteritis is isospora suis. Uh, this is a diffuse cataral enteritis which is characterized by the glistening of the hyperemic mucosa and the contracted muscularis. Uh, the transudation from capillaries immediately after uh, the loss of necrotic enterocytes contributes to loss of fluid. And as you can see in this slide, also causes an inflammatory response and exudation. So as a result, we very commonly see uh, fibrinose pseudomembranous uh, enteritis. That's another example of a diffuse fibrinonecrotic enteritis caused by isospora suis. And these yellow fibrinous pseudomembranes are easily removed from uh, the mucosa. The main differential would be a subacute clostridium perfringens type C infection. However, we will not see hemorrhages uh, even with uh, very extreme cases of uh, intestinal coccidiosis. With that, we go to Clostridium perfringens type C, which causes a percute death or necrohemorrhagic enteritis during the first four days of life. And this was a baby pig with a severe uh, bloody diarrhea, which stains the perineum. Uh, in this age pig, Clostridium perfringens type C is a top differential for bloody diarrhea and death. The cause of this bloody diarrhea is an acute necrohemorrhagic enteritis that affects primarily the jejunome and is often segmental. On higher magnification, you can see the gas bubbles in the wall of this uh, intestine. So we have uh, subserosal emphysema. There's also diffuse necrosis and some fibrinous exudate on the mucosal surface where the small intestine has been opened. Usually, lesions with uh, Clostridium perfringens type C are limited to the small intestine and very rarely in, in, uh, extend into the cecum. But on very rare occasion, we can find lesions also in the colon, as you can see here. 
So the morphological diagnosis would be acute segmental necrohemorrhagic colitis with subserosal emphysema. Pigs may develop uh, subacute or chronic disease that can lead to death after several weeks of uh, poor growth usually. Typically we find less acute hemorrhages but uh, necrotizing enteritis that can actually become uh, transmural. Lately there has been a lot of discussion about Clostridium perfringens type A as a cause of diarrhea in one to four day old pigs. The disease has a high morbidity but a low mortality and gross and microscopic lesions are rare. Uh, the only inconsistent gross finding is mesocolonic edema. Microscopically there might be a mild uh, diffuse neutrophilic enteritis affecting primarily the propria and the ileum and you can have these volcano-like eruptions from the tips of the villi. There's also tremendous overgrowth of the organism uh, in the intestine and uh, the vegetative forms may produce alpha or produce alpha toxin and may also produce other toxins. So this would be an example for mesocolonic edema. You can see here that's a spiral colon and there's a mesocolon which is extended by this uh, gelatinous fluid. Differentials again include the uh, uh, Clostridium perfringens type A and much more common with this we would see Clostridium difficile and edema disease caused by endotoxemic E. coli. This is another example of a very severe diffuse mesocolonic edema and as you can see in this case associated with a quite diffuse fibrinonecrotic uh, colitis. This condition is commonly found in 1 to 14 day old pigs and is associated with ascites subcutaneous edema and diarrhea. It is caused by Clostridium difficile and the overgrowth of Clostridium difficile in the large intestine is very often secondary to long-standing antibiotic therapy as we can see it in horses. Lasonia intracellularis is not related to Campylobacter and it's an obligate intracellular organism. It replicates in the apical crypt, uh, uh, sorry, in the apical cytoplasm of crypt epithelial cells. Uh, in the ileum especially. As a result we lose goblet cells and these crypt cells are converted into a population of highly mitotic proliferating cells. The normal gut flora seems to be necessary to induce disease as you can see here. Uh, the disease has various presentations that were given different names and even considered different conditions in the past. I will show you examples of each and also uh, give you the old names but I strongly suggest that on board examines you use porcine proliferative enteropathy as the name of the disease. Okay, that's a small intestine with a diffuse proliferative enteritis where the ileum on the bottom is much more severely affected than uh, the jejunum above. This appearance has led to the term host pipe gut and the thickening of the wall is secondary to adenomatous proliferation and uh, muscular contraction. So the normal proliferation takes place in mucosa and then muscular contraction. The old name for this disease is intestinal adenomatosis and because often the disease was limited to uh, the ileum it's also called regional ileitis. Uh, same section of intestine I showed you before with a look at the mucosa and you can hopefully appreciate the hyperplastic changes. Okay, it's a higher magnification to better show you the really deep crypts and the rigid villi of the affected gut. Coagul coagulation necrosis of the hyperplastic mucosa is commonly superimposed. So a good morphological diagnosis would be a diffuse proliferative and necrotizing enteritis. Necrosis can be the most obvious lesion and you can have a diffuse fibronecrotic pseudomembranes uh, as in this intestine. Uh, that's why the disease was also called necrotic enteritis. Lesions can progress farther and you can end up with these intraluminal casts of fibronecrotic material. So the top differential would still be Lasonia intracellularis. This is a spiral colon. And I just want to show you that uh, porcine proliferative enteropathy can also involve the cecum and the first portion of the spiral colon. So your morphologic diagnosis for this slide should be necrotizing and proliferative colitis. 
Another presentation of porcine proliferative enteropathy is a hemorrhagic proliferative enteritis. So one of your top differentials for bloody diarrhea in swine older than three months of age should be PPE. Usually you find large blood clots in the lumen of the ileum uh, above a hyperplastic mucosa. As you can see the mucosa is really rigid here. Uh, the old term for this condition is proliferative hemorrhagic enteropathy. In the majority of hemorrhagic cases, the mucosa uh, shows only hyperplastic changes, but sometimes you can find various presentations of the disease in different segments or even combined in sections of intestine. So in this case, we have a severe necrohemorrhagic and proliferative enteritis. Moving on to Brachyspira, or as it's listed here, the old name Sapulina. There are five different species of Brachyspira in swine. Brachyspira hyodysenteria uh, is a strongly beta hemolytic and it's the cause of swine dysentery. All the other species are weakly beta hemolytic, and only Brachyspira pilosicola, which you see here on the bottom, can cause intestinal spirochetosis. All the other species are non pathogenic. Also, the axial fibrils uh, might help you to differentiate between the various species. The problem is that you cannot differentiate these organisms with light microscopy using silver stains. So even if they are present in uh, microscopic lesions characteristic of the disease, uh, this would be an inconclusive diagnosis. You need something more specific, more specific techniques like PCR to confirm a diagnosis of swine dysentery or intestinal spirochetosis. Swine dysentery is another important enteric disease of swine that affects pigs mainly uh, in the grower finishing phase. Lesions are limited to the large intestine and they are characterized by uh, mucohemorrhagic colitis, as you can see it here. Whereas biohyodysentery invades the goblet cells and interferes there with the fluid and electrolyte absorption, causing hypersecretion of mucus. In more severe cases, you can then find a fibronecrotic, diffuse fibronecrotic and hemorrhagic colitis. And the destruction of cells is thought uh, to be caused by cytotoxic hemolysin, which is produced by Brachyspira uh, hyodysenteria. Again, if you use Sapulina, you will probably get, well, you will get full credit at the boards. Balantidium coli tends to overgrow in the superficial cellular debris and actually can even invade beneath the uh, uh, mucosa. And often you also have a concurrent secondary uh, infection with Salmonella typhimurium, which causes a fibronecrotic colitis. So the best differential, if somebody shows you a slide like that, will be Salmonella typhimurium, even though this was a case uh, of combined uh, s uh, wine dysentery and Salmonella typhimurium. Okay, colonic spir spirochetosis has a slightly different presentation. It is caused by Brachyspira uh, pilosicoli, and it also affects weaned uh, to adult pigs, but it causes only a mild and sometimes fibrinous colitis with loose, wet cement-like stool. It transiently colonizes the surface of the colonic mucosa and creates a false brush border. So microscopically, there's a mild, superficial, erosive colitis with goblet cell hyperplasia and mats of these serpentine spirochetes in the crypts. I copied actually the slide from a book because I didn't have a good example of a mild, diffuse, erosive colitis, and this one was caused by Brachyspira pilosicoli. And another example, same thing, a mild, diffuse fibrinocatal colitis. This is a non specific lesion that you can find in the spiral colon. It is called a colitis cystica and it results from abscessation of the lymphoglandular complexes. Here we have another example of a fibronecrotic enteritis, diffuse or more multifocal. I showed you a similar slide earlier uh, when it was caused by Salmonella corazuis, and I pointed out this multifocal appearance due to abscess of the lymphoglandular complexes. The top differential for a lesion like that should be Salmonella typhimurium. If the uh, second slide would include multifocal necrosis in the liver, then Salmonella corazuis would be probably the correct diagnosis. Salmonella uh, typhimurium 
causes also this diffuse well, multifocal to coalescing fibrinol necrotic colitis. And it is a very another cause of enteritis, a very important cause of enteritis in post wean pigs. The lesions with Salmonella typhimurium are mainly limited to the large intestine. And again, a spiral colon with a severe diffuse fibrinol necrotic colitis. Uh, this lesion appears somewhat similar to what I showed you before with Lasonia and uh, cellularis, but you not have the thickened rigid mucosa, so the top differential for this slide is Salmonella typhimurium. Salmonella typhimurium is also associated with another condition. That's a pig with abdominal distension. That's not a pot belly pig. The distension is caused by uh, distension of the colon, so we have a megacolon. And the cause of this megacolon is a rectal stricture. So remember I talked to you about uh, this type of appearance with congenital conditions. Uh, in this case, we don't have anal atresia, but we have a stricture of the rectum. And that's most likely secondary to an infection with Salmonella typhimurium causing venous infarction. It could also be, megacolon could also be a sequel to rectal prolapse. Okay, and this is an example of rectal prolapse. Risk factors for rectal prolapse include uh, genetic conditions, piling of pigs in cold weather, so crowding, laying on each other, very heavy coughing, or estrogenic mycotoxins. I like this slide. It's a high magnification of multifocal button ulcers. And I just wanted to mention again the top differentials for button ulcers in pigs. Uh, which are Salmonella corazuis, Salmonella typhimurium, probably the top differential in the U.S., uh, very rarely Salmonella typhisuis, and on uh, an important differential you shouldn't forget, foreign animal disease, classical swine fever virus. This is an example of whipworms, Trichurus suis, and notice the slender ends of some of these worms, which become difficult to see. Trichurus suis can cause a catal, the necrotic or necrohemorrhagic tovelitis and colitis in post wean pigs. And you might see, uh, you might not see adults during the early stage of the disease. So it's sometimes very easy to mistake this disease for a swine dysentery. Okay, here we have a diffuse mesocolonic hemorrhages. This was caused by anticoagulant rodenticides, in this case, warfarin intoxication. This is another presentation of warfarin intoxication. Uh, rodenticides are used to control the mouse and rat population in swine farms, and these lesions can occur when pigs have accidental access to these compounds. The toxins interfere with vitamin K utilization, uh, which results in increased blood clotting time and severe hemorrhages. Okay, we already talked about inguinal hernias, and remember, whenever you see a protruding intestine uh, in uh, such a hernia, don't forget to look for possible vascular accidents, and include these in your morph. This is a small intestinal volvulus uh, that can occur in grower and adult pigs. The infected area is sharply demarcated, you actually can see a little bit of twisted mesentery up here. A differential for volvulus is hemorrhagic bowel syndrome. Hemorrhagic bowel syndrome is a non-diarrheal gastrointestinal disease. The etiology is unknown, and it occurs in rapidly growing pigs between three to six months of age. Most of the small intestine is affected. If you look at an infected intestine uh, through a volvulus, then the mucosa is usually thick through tremendous edema. With hemorrhagic bowel syndrome, the mucosa would be thin. And you could see histologically uh, necrosis, superficial necrosis and thrombosis of some of the capillaries. In contrast to small intestinal volvulus, we have a volvulus of the spiral colon and the cecum. That is a very rare condition. I showed you this colon before when it wasn't open. So these are colonic hemorrhages. Uh, well, it's actually melena, digested blood in the colon, following gastric hemorrhages, sorry. And as you can see, the mucosa is not damaged here. 
This intestine could come from any other species. Uh, you have these white, chalky streaks uh, beneath the serosa. So this is subserosal mineralization caused by vitamin D intoxication. Vitamin D deficiency as well as excess are both classical examples uh, on the boards to be asked pathogenesis about. So you better be ready to answer a question like that. Okay, now we are in the thorax. These are the ribs. There's the aorta, the lungs, and here is the lymph node with multifocal yellow firm nodules. These are not abscesses, but granulomas. So that's a mediastinal lymph node with multifocal granulomatous lymph adenitis caused by Mycobacterium avium. Tuberculosis in pigs is most commonly caused by Mycobacterium avium and very rarely by mammalian species. The lesions are usually limited to the cervical and mesenteric lymph nodes. In the case of uh, Mycobacterium avium, they are characterized by caseous areas of necrosis. Mammalian species tend to cause more calcification and encapsulation than uh, Mycobacterium avium. So this is a multifocal caseous necrosis or pyogranulomatous lymphadenitis with probably some mineralization in it. Generalized tuberculosis is rare and tends to be caused by Mycobacterium bovis. However, this is stomach with multifocal to coalescing uh, granulomatous gastritis caused by Mycobacterium avium. This is a spleen with a generalized Mycobacterium bovis infection. The color as well as the shape, you can see some of them have actually been cut to appreciate uh, uh, you having a look inside. Uh, so these are multifocal splenic granulomas, and it helps you to differentiate this lesion from splenic infarcts or lymphoma. So this is not lymphoma, not uh, splenic infarcts, but multifocal splenic granulomas caused by Mycobacterium bovis. This is a kidney with a diffuse granulomatose nephritis, and that looks uh, quite a little bit different than the last slide I showed you. So if you would present me with this slide, even though I know in this case it was uh, caused by Mycobacterium avium, my top differential for this lesion would probably be renal lymphoma. Okay, large roundworms, Ascaris are the most common gastrointestinal worm parasite in pigs. It has a direct life cycle that involves the hepatotracheal uh, migration route. The adult worms are most commonly found in the small intestine, but they can migrate to the stomach, as you can see here, or even into the bile duct. Very, very rarely they can cause obstructions of the small intestine or of the bile ducts and even rupture. We will talk about migrating larvae later. You will love this one. This is a thorny-headed worm of swine, Macacanturinchus hyrodinaceus, that causes these nodular lesions in the ileum that also can perforate. So uh, the etiologic diagnosis of this slide would be intestinal acantocephalidiasis. Uh, with that, we move on to the liver. We already talked about multifocal hepatic necrosis, in this case caused by pseudorabies virus. And top differential would be multifocal necrotizing hepatitis caused by Salmonella coracuis. And that's what I try to show you here. Sorry for the highlights, but hopefully you can see these multifocal areas of hepatic necrosis caused by Salmonella coracuis. A synonym for this lesion is milk spots. It is caused by migrating ascarate larvae. You can see the focal thickening of the interlobular connective tissue. And there are also single small foci with scarring that have contracted the capsule. And this lesion was caused by uh, migrating uh, ascarate suez larvae. So the morphological diagnosis would be chronic multifocal and include eosinophilic because you know the pathogenesis interstitial hepatitis. The second condition that can be uh, that is associated with migrating larvae is caused by strongyloid nematodes. Uh, in this case the kidney worm uh, of pigs which is Stephanurus dentatus. The L4 larvae migrate in the portal way into the liver and mold there to L5 larvae. The lesions are much more severe than those caused by ascaris suis, and they are characterized by eosinophilic inflammation, abscesses, and scarring. 
toxic hepatopathies are common and can be caused by a variety of toxins or deficiencies. The pathogenesis is quite similar for many of these diseases uh, and we either can have a myocardial uh, necrosis, cardiomyopathy actually, uh, as with gossipol that can result in uh, secondary chronic hepatic congestion leading to centrilobular hepatic uh, congestion and necrosis or we can have a direct insult uh, of centrilobular hepatocytes as the santium species. Other differentials include fumonacin, aflatoxin, coltars or hepatosis dietetica. This is the liver uh, with chronic, chronic hepatosis dietetica. You can see diffuse hepatic cirrhosis, which is characterized by fibrosis, some regeneration, and certainly there was a loss, uh, atrophy necrosis of this liver, so all three components of cirrhosis are there. Uh, the condition seems to have a very complex etiology, so it might, you might find it not only in cases where you actually have a cardiomyopathy, but also in cases without, and uh, it is not only associated, as it seems in these cases, with uh, vitamin E, or selenium deficiency, but also deficiency of sulfur-containing amino acids. Okay, this is a cross-section of liver of a pig with acute hepatosis dietetica, and uh, you can see this extensive centrilobular congestion followed by hemorrhages and necrosis. Okay, with that, we move on to cockleburr, which is an annual herb where the two-leaf seedling stage has the highest toxic potential, so the dicotyledone stage. The toxic principle is carboxyatractulosid, and an ingestion results in centrilobular congestion and necrosis. On cross-section, you can appreciate the accentuated lobular pattern, which is called by centrilobular congestion and necrosis. Last example of toxic hepatopathy uh, is this liver from a pig with aflatoxicosis. We have a diffuse atrophy and fatty degeneration, which is characterized by this light brown color, a friable consistency and loss of elasticity. And uh, aflatoxins are also mitogenic, so histologically, in addition to the lesion you would find with the other toxins, you would also find things like cytomegaly, uh, uh, and multiple nuclei and cells and uh, an increased mitotic figure, so proliferation of hepatocytes. This is a liver with diffuse hepatic necrosis and atrophy and secondary fibrosis. Uh, this is from an experimental uh, study uh, inoculating pigs with porcine circovirus type 2. Uh, the hepatic lesions are secondary to myocardial necrosis resulting in cardiomyopathy. Uh, so we have chronic hepatic congestion causing this type of lesion. On cross-section through this liver, you can appreciate the extensive fibrosis and also regeneration, and some of it is just blood-filled chronic hepatic congestion. So other causes of myocardial necrosis can result in exactly the same type of lesion. With that, we move on to the respiratory system. This is a normal lung. It is pliable, it's pink and it's collapsed. I will use cranial, middle and caudal to describe lesions in the lung uh, which lobules are affected. Uh, pigs have, lungs have complete lobules and that helps us to recognize uh, the distribution and some of the diseases because especially bronchopneumonias tend to be well demarcated and therefore easy to be distinguished. The first condition in the respiratory tract is atrophic rhinitis. Progressive atrophic rhinitis occurs at two to five weeks of age and is associated with sneezing and rarely uh, epistaxis. It is caused by cytotoxins produced by toxigenic strains of serotype uh, D and rarely serotype A, uh, Pastorella motosida. The toxin is absorbed and causes bony hypoplasia by inhibiting osteoblast and chondrocyte uh, proliferation and in most likely indirectly also stimulating uh, osteoclasts. There's a pig with a deformed snout, which is secondary to uh, alterations of the nasal turbinates and deviation of the septa caused by progressive 
atrophic rhinitis. You have a cross-section of normal and atrophic nasal cavities and the most severe alterations occur in the ventral turbinates. You can also often see deviation of the septa. And secondary to that, you have mesenchymal proliferation that occurs as a compensatory process. Bordetella bronchiseptica can also uh, cause an atrophic rhinitis, but it's a non-progressive atrophic rhinitis. Uh, Bordetella is a very easy colonizer of the upper respiratory tract and causes a transient atrophic rhinitis that, is the re that regenerates if there is no secondary bacterial infection involved. Interstitial pneumonias are very common in swine and can be caused by numerous viruses. Bacterial septicemias are also be of allergic reaction caused by migrating ascarid larvae. We already talked about interstitial pneumonias caused by bacterial septicemias and that they are characterized or they result from uh, the vascular damage. Uh, so we have hemorrhagic uh, interstitial uh, edema. Viral pneumonias are grossly often indistinguishable from each other. So I will go through the different uh, types of viral interstitial pneumonias and try to give you uh, or point out some of the differences we might find with these. First, uh, this is an example of a hemorrhagic interstitial pneumonia. And as I mentioned before, this could be caused by highly virulent strains of pseudorabies virus. The affected pigs uh, may be coughing, sneezing, and heavy breathing. And microscopically, you could find randomly distributed throughout these lungs uh, multifocal necrosis, which can help you differentiate this lesion from others. This is a submucosal hematoma in the trachea, uh, which is a rare lesion caused by swine influenza virus. Swine influenza is a herd disease that affects all ages of animals. It is uh, strictly limited to the respiratory tract and uh, is caused by type A influenza virus. There are two subtypes, H1 and N1, and H3 and N2 that circulate among swine worldwide, and H1, N1 is more common in the US. The typical lesion in lungs uh, with from pigs affected with swine influenza virus is an interstitial pneumonia with lobular atelectasis, uh, which gives the lungs a pattern which has been called a checkerboard pattern. Atelectasis is the result of a necrotizing bronchiolitis, which is a microscopic hallmark lesion of swine influenza virus, and it affects primarily the smaller airways, and therefore uh, it is grossly not recognizable. In very severe cases, Pigs can have a diffuse interstitial pneumonia with multifocal hemorrhages that are scattered throughout the lungs, as you can see here. This is another example of a very diffuse interstitial pneumonia. Uh, clinical influenza is uh, characterized uh, by pigs which have a really barking cough. Commonly, there are secondary bacterial bronchopneumonias, as you can find here. And again, the cranioventral areas are dark red and consolidated. These secondary bacterial pneumonias are the main reasons for long-term losses and problems uh, associated with swine influenza virus. Uh, this is a diffuse interstitial pneumonia which was caused by uh, porcine respiratory coronavirus, which is a deletion type mutant of TGE virus. This was an experimental case because most of the naturally occurring cases are actually subclinical and only a very few produce gross lesions. Uh, porcine respiratory coronavirus affects nursery and grower age pigs and the pneumonic lesions are really indistinguishable from other viral pneumonias. I showed you a similar lung before. This is a severe diffuse interstitial pneumonia with lobular atelectasis from a pig with PMWS. And another example of a severe diffuse interstitial pneumonia with lobular atelectasis uh, that is indistinguishable more or less from the previous slide. However, in this case, uh, it was caused by PERS virus. Pigs with respiratory PERS have heavy breathing but no cough. This is severe proliferative interstitial pneumonia that is microscopically characterized by type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia. The lesion has been suggested to be caused by a PERS virus 
or possibly an antigenic variant of a slightly H1N1 positive swine influenza virus. This is a severe diffuse hemorrhagic interstitial pneumonia caused by Salmonella coracuus, I showed you earlier. And a similar uh, appearing lung, in this case caused by Haemophilus parasuus. So you have the two differentials beside each other. Another example of a diffuse interstitial pneumonia is multifocal hemorrhages. Uh, that could be caused by any virus I showed you before, but in this case it's an allergic pneumonia uh, caused by migrating ascarate larvae. So you really can't tell these grossly apart. Histologically, you could. This is a cross-section of the previous lung. You can see that it's non-collapsed, modeled. There's no fluid draining, uh, no bronchiolar exudate, no fluid draining from the uh, bronchi, bronchioli. Microscopically, there would be an eosinophilic prebronchiolar interstitial pneumonia, so you could tell it apart from viral diseases. I showed you exactly the same slide before. This is a multifocal embolic fibronocortic pneumonia, and it was caused by actin bacillus suis. This is a multifocal embolic abscessing pneumonia. Your top differential, based on what I told you before, should be Arcanobacterium pyogenes. However, in this case, it was a very rare infection with Aspergillus fumigatus. The only problem you can have on this slide is to recognize it as lung. These are multifocal pyogranulomas, and they were caused by Mycobacterium avium. Okay, let's now talk about bronchopneumonias. Mycoplasma hyonomonia is the initiator of enzootic pneumonia, and it's one of the most important diseases in swine. It causes chronic disease uh, with a low mortality and a high morbidity. It spreads quite slowly, and the majority of pigs with disease are in the grower finishing phase. Clinically, it is characterized by a dry, hacking cough. Grossly, the lesions of early uh, mycoplasmosis are a catarrhal bronchopneumonia, which is characterized by these collapsed, firm, purple to red, sometimes grayish, appearing craniovental lobules that also might sometimes the middle lobule here and just the tip of uh, the caudal uh, lobes. If I would be presented with a slide, that's probably really atelectasis. So that's very characteristic of a primary mycoplasmosis without secondary bacterial infections. Okay, on cross-section, uh, you can see that the airways contain this opaque uh, mucus, and uh, which is usually clear. Uh, as if uh, secondary bronchopneumonia develops, then we can also have fibrin, as shown here in these airways. So whenever we have secondary bacterial bronchopneumonias on top of mycoplasma hyonomonia, then we end up with uh, mucopurulent bronchopneumonia. And you can see that the globes down here are consolidated from mucopurulent exudate. Mycoplasma hyonomonia colonizes the brush border of the upper respiratory tract and also the pulmonary airways. And it causes destruction of the cilia and then, therefore, a functional impairment of the mucociliary apparatus. This reduces the pulmonary clearance of the bacteria and also increases the susceptibility of the lungs to secondary opportunistic pathogens. And that results in a separative bronchopneumonia infection with secondary pathogens. So this type of lesion is then termed enzootic pneumonia. In this case, you can see here a bronchopneumonia with a typical distribution of enzootic pneumonia. It affects the craniovental lobes. Uh, we also have a localized pruritus here. And the most common secondary bacteria that we can find, actually the most common at all, is Pastorella multocida. Uh, but other bacteria may include Streptococcus suus, Haemophilus parasuus, and uh, certainly Arcanobacterium pyogenes. This is a classical example of an enzymotic pneumonia. We have a purulent bronchopneumonia, which is characterized by these, these consolidated red, purple, very firm uh, craniovental lobes. And this one was caused by primary mycoplasmosis and secondary pastorelosis. If you give this lesion as the only cause, 
pastorella motosita, you are wrong. You need the primary mycoplasmosis, and then you get a secondary infection with pastorella motosida leading to, to this lesion. Pastorella motosida, in most cases, on its own, will not be able to cause a lesion like that. If these lungs get infected secondarily with Arcanobacterium pyogenes, we can also have a purulent bronchopneumonia with abscessation, as you can see here, sequestration and tremendous fibrosis. And these abscesses become, can become very large and they can rupture. And as a result, you can have a bronchopneumonia with a localized fibrinous pruritus. There's the abscess, there's the bronchopneumonia. So that's the ribcage kind of flipped over to the side. Bordetella bronchiseptica can sometimes cause a very unique necrohemorrhagic bronchopneumonia in very young suckling pigs. The affected pigs have a very loud hacking cough and they are dyspneuric and die very often during the first to two days of age. The cranioventral uh, parenchyma or lobes of the affected lungs are very firm and they are red from hemorrhage, they are often actually black and on cross section they would appear kind of granular due to the severe necrosis. If lesions become more chronic, then the lobules can be replaced by necrotic tissue, hemorrhages, neutrophils, and serofibrinous edema, F and finally undergo fibrosis, as you can see here. Sometimes you also can have a local pleuropneumonia caused by actinobacillus pleuropneumonia. is another costly and important disease of swine. It commonly affects grower and finishing uh, age pigs. And disease can be paracute with sudden death and epistaxis, as you can see here in the terminal stages. There are 12 serovars of APP, and 1, 5, and 7 are the most common ones in the US. The characteristic lesion of Actinobacillus pleuropneumonia is a fibrinous pleuritis associated with circumscribed areas of fibrinohemorrhagic pleuropneumonia. This is a higher magnification of a lung with diffuse fibrinohemorrhagic pleuropneumonia. Uh, also, you can't see much fibrin. Uh, the pleura has lost its smooth shining, surf shining surface, and the underlying parenchyma uh, is dark red uh, from necrosis and hemorrhages. So that's a more chronic uh, fibrinous pleuropneumonia. On cross-section, you can see the lobular distribution of the lesion. APP is an airborne disease, and lesions are caused by three cytotoxins uh, similar to Pastorella hemolytica toxins. They are toxins, uh, they, these toxins are toxic to a variety of cells, and these cells include, for instance, endothelial cells. There's also a very strong cytokine response uh, that can cause further tissue damage. Lesions uh, can coalesce and become sequestered, as you can see it here, and microscopically you would see sequestration of areas of hemorrhages and necrosis by streaming inflammatory cells and then secondary fibrosis. The early damage in these lungs is uh, characterized by necrosis and hemorrhages, which appear uniform, dark red, and you have the typical lobular distribution. When the lesions age, these lobules become lighter in color and firm due to the infiltration of inflammatory cells and also fibrosis. So these changes are also referred to as red and gray hepatization. This is a fibrinohemorrhagic pneumonia and also a fibrinous peri and epicarditis, which is also caused by APP. The vascular damage results in this fibrinous uh, exudation. Differentials for a combination of uh, the pleuropneumonia and the fibrinous uh, pericarditis include actinobacillus suis and in very rare cases pastorella hemolytica. Often APP pneumonias have a unilateral distribution, so don't forget to include that in your morphological diagnosis. And the right lungs, for whatever reason, are often more, or more often affected than the left lungs. That's another presentation of APP, and these are multifocal pulmonary sequester that may cavitate or form abscesses. This is a very severe 
fibrononecrotic bronchopneumonia with hemorrhages, and that's a rare lesion which can be caused by certain strains of Streptococcus suis. Okay, here we have a hydrothorax with diffuse pulmonary edema. You might just see it here on the edges of these lungs, which was caused by fumonisin intoxication. Fumonisin inhibits uh, ceramide synthetase in the sphingolipid uh, biosynthetic pathway, which causes also unique accumulations of membranes in endothelial cells, alveolar endothelial cells. These endothelial cells uh, are damaged by fumonensin uh, intoxication, and that's most likely the critical event in the pathogenesis of the edema. Okay, that's another example of severe pulmonary edema caused by fumonisin. You have no indication in this lung of uh, pneumonia. So other differentials for this type of lesion would also include possible heart failure, uh, so any type of cardiomyopathy resulting secondary and pulmonary edema. I just want to remind you that bacterial septicemias can also cause pulmonary edema uh, and that there might have not been much time to develop uh, in interstitial pneumonia. Uh, this is from a colostrum-deprived piglet with E. coli septicemia. And uh, bacterial septicemias can also cause pulmonary arterial thrombosis. You can see here the thrombus occluding the artery, that which can also result in e pulmonary edema. Here we have lobular emphysema and atelectasis of the margins of the lung, and that's a very characteristic lesion. So lobular emphysema and marginal atelectasis. It is secondary to obstruction caused by lungworms, Metastrongylus elengedis, uh, earlier Metastrongylus apri. Uh, and you can see here that they obstruct some of the airways and are also associated with the catarrhal bronchitis. So this is an example of a diaphragmatic hernia. It's probably difficult to even see what organs have protruded into the thorax, but that's the stomach, and this lesion can be either congenital or it can also be acquired, uh, for instance, by excess vitamin E. Another congenital condition that's of no clinical consequence, that's hepatic and pulmonary melanosis. When you see this red discoloration associated with pulmonary edema and even with uh, black precipitation in the trachea, then you can be sure that this is carboxyhemoglobinemia, most likely in this case caused by smoke inhalation. With that, we move to the cardiovascular system. The deficiency of vitamin E or selenium results in the inability to effectively dispose of oxygen-free radicals. The oxidation by uh, these radicals can result or will result in the degeneration of cardiac and skeletal muscles. This uh, can occur at any age, but is most common in intensive rearing systems between 6 to 20 weeks of age. The resulting disease is called Mulberry Heart Disease and is characterized by these multifocal myocardial hemorrhages and necrosis. On cross-section, you can see that these multifocal hemorrhages extending transmural. I apologize for the highlights on the slide. We mentioned gossipol intoxication earlier. The toxicosis follows a prolonged feeding of cotton meal, uh, which is a byproduct of the cotton oil industry. And uh, this cotton meal is fed as a protein supplement and contains gossipol. If the concentrations are too high, it can cause severe myocardial necrosis. And as a result, you can see hydropericardium and actually a sterile fibrinous epicarditis. This is another example of a multifocal uh, necrotizing actually myocarditis. Uh, it's caused by porcine parvovirus. And microscopically, you would see a lymphoplasma cytic myocarditis uh, associated with necrosis. Differentials would include the encephalomyocarditis virus and the neonates PERS virus and porcine circovirus type 2. Well, that's a typical lesion which has been referred to as bread and butter lesion, and this is fibrinous epicarditis and pericarditis, and I gave you differentials before. The top three differentials include streptococcus suis, haemophilus parasuus, and mycoplasma hyorhinus. 
and the high magnification of a heart, the corner, corner tendine again help you to identify it as a heart. Uh, this is a vegetative mural endocarditis and the uh, differentials include streptococcus suis, actin bacillus suis and erysipelotrix rhizopathiae. Here we have a complete thrombosis of the right ventricle, probably uh, secondary to a vegetative valvular endocarditis and the most likely cause of this lesion would be actinomyces, uh, Acanobacterium pyogenes. And an unusual lesion that is severe diffuse epicardial mineralization which followed vitamin D intoxication. Okay, let's move on to the skin. First I want to talk about some vesicular diseases. That's an example of a vesicular nasal dermatitis also with blanching of the coronary band in the same pig. And that's not blanching but necrosis and separation actually of the coronary band. Both of these lesions were caused by foot and mouse disease. That's an aftervirus as I mentioned before of a special importance right now in Europe. The so necrosis of the coronary band can also be a sequel to multiple bacterial septicemias and especially uh, erysipelas and salmonella corazuas can cause a similar lesion. That's uh, another example of foot and mouse disease causing a necroulcerative thelitis and I also showed you earlier a slide of a vesicular glossitis. Uh, whereas uh, foot and mouse disease is a foreign animal disease, vesicular stomatitis rarely occurs in the US. It is caused by a raptovirus and it can mimic foot and mouse disease as you can see in this slide with a vesicular nasal dermatitis. Another example of a vesicular stomatitis that's a vesicular ulcerative dermatitis of uh, the coronary band or vesicular ulcerative uh, pododermatitis along the coronary band. There are two other differentials for vesicular diseases that can both appear the same and they all four diseases can mimic each other. Swine vesicular disease is caused by an enterovirus and is a foreign animal disease and vesicular exanthema is caused by a calicivirus and is extremely rare in the US. It has been reported in pigs that had been fed sea lion garbage from animals that uh, had been infected with the San Miguel sea lion virus. This is a management related disease that is also known as bullnose. It is characterized by a necrotizing nasal cellulitis and dermatitis and is most likely secondary to bacterial infection uh, of all lesions following clipping of the teeth. Okay, there's also a management related condition. In this slide you can still see that we have these needle teeth. So following cutaneous lacerations and secondary bacterial infections you can see the development of such an exudative dermatitis. The most common uh, cause of such an exudative uh, dermatitis is Staphylococcus hyacus and so this would be an exudative facial uh, dermatitis. This disease can rapidly spread throughout the entire body causing a diffuse exudative epidermitis or greasy pig disease. And we also can have an exudative nasal dermatitis or epidermitis again caused by Staphylococcus uh, hyacus and part of greasy pig disease. This lesion is an exudative pododermatitis uh, of the coronary band and it's also caused by Staphylococcus hyacus. Pigs can catch their claws in perforated flooring. And everywhere you have lacerations you can get these secondary infections with Staphylococcus hyacus. These are multifocal cutaneous infarcts. They are caused by erysipelas. And they have a typical rhomboid or diamond shaped appearance. As I mentioned before, the top differential would be an infection with Actinobacillus suis. Another example of multifocal hemorrhagic infarct, some of them well defined, demarcated, others poorly defined and becoming coalescent. And this is an example of hemorrhagic cutaneous infarcts uh, associated with porcine dermatitis and nephropathy syndrome. Okay, let's talk about some vices. 
pigs are very curious animals and tend to fight and chew on each other. So especially when they are remax or uh, if they didn't have any time to establish uh, new hierarchies, you can uh, be sure that you can see some of these lesions. They tend to bite into each other's ears and go in circles around each other. So these are multifocal cutaneous lacerations and scabs of the pinna. Uh, these lacerations can be secondary infected primarily with Arcanobacterium pyogenes or other bacteria and then necrosis can occur. And a similar type of lesion, so that's again, that's a pinna and you can see here the diffuse necrosis and the function of the upper portion of said uh, secondary uh, possibility how this lesion can occur would be a necrotizing vasculitis and secondary ischemic infarction caused by bacterial septicemias and especially uh, Salmonella coracuris has to be one of your top differentials. This is another example of an acute cutaneous infarction. It is bilateral. You can hopefully appreciate the sharp line of demarcation between the necrotic and the normal skin and these clippings are earmarks and have nothing to do with the lesion. This was caused by frostbite. And uh, this lesion can occur when pigs are transported in the winter in open trailers, especially on the interstate. And the uh, high wind chills actually cause freezing of the ears and vascular damage. You can appreciate this tremendous edema in the areas of acute necrosis. If lesion, these lesions become more chronic, they will become dry and black, typical of gangrenous necrosis. And actually, the ears might slough off. Tail biting also occurs in stressed pigs because of crowding and when pigs are remixed too often and did not establish social structures. So this is just necrosis of the tail. Another problem that can occur in neonatal pigs post weaning is navel sucking, especially when the diet is inadequate. That not only leads to an inadequate uh, uh, input of, of food, uh, in an inadequate diet in these animals, but also to sucking on e each other's navels causing an omphalitis. So we can have this necrotizing omphalitis as you can see it here. Uh, this lesion can become secondary infected, especially with Arcanobacterium pyogenes or other bacteria, and you can have umbilical abscesses or an abscessing omphalophlebitis. This can be followed by an embolic septicemia. This is a very uncommon lesion. There's a chronic cutaneous ulcer. You can see the deep granulation tissue deep down in this ulcer. It's caused uh, by Borrelia suis, and it's called a spiroketal granuloma. Microscopically, with silver stains, you would uh, identify uh, spirochetes in this lesion. This is a common lesion in pigs. The brownish, discolored areas of alopecia and hyperkeratosis are ringworm. So this is a hyperkeratotic dermatitis and focal alopecia, which is caused by Microsporum parvum or Trichophyton verrucosum. Don't forget that this is a zoonotic disease. And a multifocal necrohemorrhagic dermatitis goes quite deep. That's another management uh, uh, associated problem. It's caused by insect bites and it's usually associated with an infestation of the underfloor manure storage pits with mosquitoes or flying arthropods. Hey, this is a hyperkeratotic dermatitis of the ear, which is associated with sarcoptic mange caused by Sarcoptis scabiae variant suis. And as we all know, these are burrowing mites in the external layers of the epidermis. Another condition in pigs is swine pox. Due to changes in swine production system uh, and drugs, lice, and therefore swine pox are extremely rare. However, infrequently we can still see congenital swine pox occurring sporadically in some lice free herds. So that suggests that there is still swine pox out there as an endemic disease uh, without uh, the association of uh, lice. At this magnification, you can appreciate the proliferative and nodular dermatitis. This nodular dermatitis is usually associated with pediculosis and the distribution of the lesion follows the lice habitat. This is a large suckling louse hematopinous suis. 
This is a slide with two morphological diagnoses. We have early pox lesions and we have NITS. So we have pediculosis with a multifocal proliferative or hyperplastic dermatitis. So these are early lesions. Let me show what's happened if these lesions develop. Then they may cavitate, as you can see here. Uh, so we have central necrosis. So this is a multifocal proliferative dermatitis with central necrosis. In pigmented pigs, nodules are dark and take on the color of the skin. So again, another slide with uh, multifocal proliferative and pustular dermatitis. I just give you a couple of differentials which you can apply in one or the other way. There should be something of proliferative and then depending on uh, the long-standing effect of the lesion necrosis or cavitation or something like that should be in your morphological diagnosis. Okay, believe it or not, that's also swine pox with a tremendously extended area of necrosis. But if you look here in the edge, you still have a proliferative lesion. So again, that's a multifocal proliferative and ulcerative dermatitis. This is quite a severe diffuse skin lesion. That's a diffuse parakeratotic, hyperkeratotic dermatitis, which predominantly affects the ears, head, going along the dorsal side and also down the legs of this pig. The top differential for this lesion is zinc deficiency, a chronic, uh, chronic solar dermatitis, so a severe sunburn might be able to cause a similar lesion, but that would primarily affect the ears and not really the legs. Okay, let's go to CNS diseases. Uh, the vast majority of various causes of viral encephalitis do not result in gross lesions, so I will not talk too much about them. The typical microscopic lesions of viral causes uh, of encephalitis uh, are non-separative meningoencephalitis associated with perivascular coughing and glial nodules. And you can see here a list of organisms which can all cause uh, this type of lesion in pigs. Let's move to the bacterial meningitis because here we have gross lesions associated with it. This is a purulent meningitis. Uh, we already talked about this condition. The top differentials include streptococcus suus, haemophilus parasuus, and others. And you can see here the fibrin precipitated and the tremendous in inhibition of blood with these vessels. Often the exudate will gravitate to the ventral brainstem. So the left side of the trapezoid body is abscessed, as you can see here. An alternative pathogenesis for this lesion might be an uh, infection extending via the eighth nerve uh, from an otitis media or interna. Pigs can survive surprisingly long with bacterial lesions, and this is an encephalitis with multifocal abscesses. Some of them, the exudate actually has been reabsorbed and causing secondary cerebellar herniation and cortical atrophy. That's certainly no pause in Einstein. This is a cross-section of a head of a pig with a tympanic bulla here. Uh, this is a severe diffuse purulent otitis media. Uh, it's not an uncommon lesion in pigs. The most common isolate from a lesion like that would be streptococcus suus or uh, apiogenes, <coughs> excuse me, or pastorella multocida. A recent paper describes mycoplasma hyorhinus as a predisposing agent which causes the eustachitis that would interfere with clearance mechanism resulting in an ascending secondary bacterial infection. That still has to be proven, up, but I think it's a really, really good hypothesis. And another abscess caused by a pyogenes, you can see here. Uh, I include that slide to again point out when you see a lesion like that to make sure that you include the location, so that would be a unilateral uh, cortical abscess with a concurrent leptomeningitis. Edema disease is a difficult disease to know where to describe. It's a third of the E. coli disease I'm going to talk about. Uh, it is caused by uh, E. coli and uh, some people also call it an enterotoxemic E. coli. It occurs in nursery-aged pigs when their diet is changed. The disease is caused by hemolytic strains of serotypes 0139 uh, 0141 and 0142. 
It colonizes small intestine by F18, AB or K88 fimbrian secretes a sugar-like toxin type 2 variant. This toxin induces systemic angiopathy in small muscular arteries and it, uh, the lesion is characterized microscopically by uh, mural degeneration and mural and perivascular edema. The most important lesion is uh, malacia and the brainstem which causes clinical CNS disease and that's why uh, I decided to talk about the edema, edema disease at this point. So this is edema disease causing palpebral edema. It also causes edema of the gastric mucosa as well as it can of the mesentery. So you can see it here. Some of these E. coli strains also have heat stable endotoxin, so you might actually find uh, concurrent secretory diarrhea. Another good example of edema disease, this is a gastric mucosa which is modeled. Here's a muscularis and all this is edema. And the same type of gelatinous edema I showed you before with Clostridium difficile or possibly Clostridium perfringens type A in the mesocolon. There's another condition which is called Harding's cerebral spinal angiopathy. Uh, it is common in grower and adult pigs and it's most likely caused by sugar-like toxin type 2 variants. This is a close-up of the brain and we have here the middle cerebral artery. Uh, it is enlarged and nodular uh, due to a nodular arthritis with leptomeningitis. This lesion is similar to periarthritis nodosa as you can see it in some of the lab animals. Sorry, but the ruler is upside down on this slide. As a sequel to uh, the vascular accident we see uh, with Harding cerebral spinal angiopathy, you can have focal hemorrhages and actually infarction of the basal ganglia. Let's now talk about posterior paralysis and paresis in pigs. Uh, this clinical condition can be caused by lesions in the spinal cord, bones, muscles, vertebral column and nerves. As you can see, multiple causes of spinal cord lesions, or very important ones, will only cause microscopic lesions. I will only talk about uh, disease which cause gross lesions, and we'll go through a couple of slides here. This is one of the more common lesions uh, which are seen in pigs which are down. This is a paravertebral abscess. It's a greenish color and the creamy consistency indicated it's most likely caused by apiogenes and such a lesion can be secondary to tail biting. Um, these abscesses begin usually in the physeal vessels that are blocked by bacterial emboli of apiogenes. They then end up as a purulent discospondylitis as you can see it here. Uh, and later on it can end up as lysis of the bone and vertebral abscesses. These abscesses can impinge on the spinal cord as in this case, or they can rupture uh, and can cause focal myelomalacia or an atrophy of the spinal cord. They can, you can also end up with an ankylosing spondylosis. Or in some cases, abscesses can even cause pathologic fractures, as you can see it here. Uh, in this case, associated with discospondylitis, spondylosis and hemorrhages. This is a condition which occurs in sows. We have necrosis of the annulus fibrosis and rupture of the nucleus pulposus. This can lead to fibrocartilaginous emboli uh, followed by ischemic necrosis of the spinal cord, a lesion which we uh, can see in DAX sounds. This is a very uncommon and unfortunate lesion. Both of these pigs have posterior hemi hemiparesis and also a necrotic pododermatitis, both actually of their right hind foot. This lesion is secondary to an injection site trauma and then a secondary bacterial infection which results in an abscess and necrosis which surrounds the sciatic nerve causing hemiparesis. This is an example of lameness caused by osteochondrosis. The lesion is dyschondroplasia of the ischial physis. So a good morphological diagnosis would be apophysiolysis tuberous ischii. Another example of osteochondrosis affecting the femur head. So this is epiphysiolysis capitis 
femoris, we have a piece of bone in here, and also the ruptured li ligamentum acetabulum. Uh, and as a result, you end up with this muscular hemorrhage and necrosis. It can occur between 6 and 18 months of age due to a discrepancy between weight gain and skeletal maturation. Okay, this is an example of rupture of the hamstring muscle due to compartment syndrome. So simple morphological diagnosis would just be skeletal muscular necrosis and hemorrhage. Another cause of an animal being down is an overriding mid-shaft femoral fracture. We can also have a fracture of the femur head or the epiphysis. All of these can be caused by lactogenic osteoporosis if the feeding is incorrect or also by trauma from breeding accidents. This is a secondary infected abscessed coxofemoral joint. It's again, it's caused by apiogenous Look at the color and consistency of the pyogenic material. These bacteremic lesions and poorly doing pigs are fairly common. And again, color and consistency should tell you that's most likely apiogenous. Okay, lameness in swine can be caused by bacterial uh, or degenerative arthritis or other mechanical causes. And I will go through a couple of examples showing you the various gross lesions. An intensive rearing system, the flooring system is uh, often perforated to keep pigs clean. So if pigs have soft claws, then they can have various lacerations uh, that can get infected by secondary bacteria. So these are polydermal abrasions uh, with a secondary polyarthritis of the digits. The most common differentials for a lesion like that include apiogenes, E. coli, and streptococcus suis. Same situation here, which leads to a phalangeal arthritis and abscessation. So even though uh, you don't see the pus here, uh, location of the lesion and extent makes it most likely a phalangeal arthritis and abscessation. Okay, that's a cross section through a carpophalangeal joint with severe chronic arthritis and periarthritis uh, with edema. This was caused in this case by Streptococcus equisimilis. In some arthritis, we can have large deposits of fibrin. So in this case, we have a fibrinous arthritis of the carpal joint, and that was caused by Haemophilus parasuus. This is an example of a very acute arthritis, where the joint capsule is filled with serofibrinous fluid. Here's the head of the femur. There's the acetabulum. So this is a coxofemoral joint. And this one was caused by mycoplasma hyosinovia. And this is an example of a proliferative synovitis of the stifle joint. There's a pastella. The top differentials for this type of proliferative lesion include erysipel lotrex rusopatia and mycoplasma hyosinovia. This is just a physial abscess of the tibiotarsal joint. And this is just another example of a bacteremic pig, so a poor doing pig infected with apiogenes. Next condition is osteochondrosis dissecans. It was thought that this is an inflammatory lesion, but it's actually a degenerative joint disease, uh, which is caused by ischemic necrosis of the articular epiphyseal or epiphyseal cartilage complex. So a good morphological diagnosis would be epiphyseal subarticular osteonecrosis. Necrosis followed by flaps of cartilage that slough off, uh, looking like this here. And so the onset of lameness is typically in pigs older than four months of age. Here we look actually down uh, in this articulated stifle joint, which has a rupture of the anterior cruciate ligaments with some hemorrhages. This lesion can occur in sows and boars due to breeding accidents. This is a hygroma uh, of the plantar surface of the hock joint. That's a quite a common lesion in pigs that have been reared, uh, reared in, on cement floors. And it's really of no consequences. And the glistening pearls here are characteristic for granulation tissue. Okay, now I want to look at uh, various causes of cervical cellulitis and lymphadenitis. This is anthrax, which causes this 
edema, cervical edema of the ventral neck. Uh, it's a very uncommon condition in pigs because pigs are actually quite resistant to an infection with bacillus anthracis. They usually get infected by consuming purely rendered uh, uh, bone meal from infected cattle that contain spores. Differentials include clostridial infections uh, or a retropharyngeal lymphadenitis caused by Streptococcus porcinus. This is an acute gangrenous dermatitis of the ventral neck caused by Clostridium septicum. You can appreciate the sharp line of demarcation between the necrotic and normal skin. This is a wound infection which is caused by contaminated needles used to give an injection. The most common injection site in older pigs is behind the ears to avoid damage of the hem muscles. So that's where you most commonly find this type of gangrenous dermatitis and myositis. This is a cross section through this neck muscle with a severe necrotizing and also is emphysematous myositis. This lesion is very dry and it's almost black appearing, so kind of similar to black leg and ruminants. The most common isolates in pigs are Clostridium septicum and then also Clostridium chauvii and novii. This is a pig with a tetany. Uh, there are two differentials in pigs with tetany. The first one is infection with Clostridium tetanus. The other one is porcine stress syndrome, which is a genetic condition. And this porcine stress syndrome is associated with acute bilateral muscular necrosis of the apexial muscles. So the packing house industry, uh, this lesion is also referred to as PSE pork, pale, soft and exudative. And these are the steaks when you put them in your frying pan, uh, shrink uh, three times and, and you end up with these little steaks where you had before one which you barely could fit in. Okay, and this is a slide of acute muscular necrosis of the lumbar muscles caused by monensin intoxication. The toxic effect can be potentiated by tiamolin, and the main differential for this lesion would be vitamin E uh, and selenium deficiency. With this we go to the urogenital system. This is a relatively uncommon lesion in pigs. It is severe diffuse mammary edema and I want to contrast that lesion to mastitis. The edema affects all mammary glands you can see here. With mastitis you can usually see single or multiple glands being involved because pigs have individual, individual mammary glands and the mastitis occurs as an ascending infection up the teeth sinuses. So this is a multifocal necrotizing mastitis which is characterized by these dark red and sometimes swollen, opaque appearing uh, edematous areas. Differentials include mainly fecal bacteria such as Klebsiella, E. coli and Citrobacter. Uh, especially Klebsiella had been associated uh, with wood shavings that had been used as beddings and because that's not very common anymore in modern swine industry, mastitis isn't a very common lesion either. The normal ovary that is inactive with very small follicles and that's a normal ovary from a cycling sow with a regressing corpus luteum and multiple graphian follicles. These are uh, two ovaries which uh, have multiple follicular cysts. I don't have a ruler, but I have a lightning match. Small cysts are often estrogen producing, causing lymphomania. And large cysts are progesterone producing, which uh, inhibits uh, estro estrocyclicity. This is a normal vulva of a sow. This is a swollen vulva of a sow that is either an estrus or it's affected by estrogenic mycotoxins. The most common one is seralinone, uh, which is produced by Fusarium roseum. Seralinone is associated with multiple conditions. First, the uh, vulva vaginitis and vulva and rectal prolapse, and then second, it is also luteotropic. So sows will be an unestrus and have pseudopregnancy. Let's move on to the uterus. This is the uterus of a sow with a severe diffuse transmural fibrinohemorrhagic metritis, which is in this case caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Fecal bacteria such as E. coli can cause a similar lesion. Swine have very long uterine horns, and if you're not careful, 
you might mistaken them for small intestines. There are a couple of things which help you differentiate these two. Uh, if contracted in the uterus, you will have longitudinal folds, and in the small intestine, you will have uh, circumferential folds. Also, you have the broad ligament of the uterus, and you should see, I don't know whether I can see it on this slide, on both sides, uh, the uterine arteries, whereas you only have one artery in the mesentery of the intestine. This is the cross-section of the open uterine horn, and you can see here a transmural fibrinohemorrhagic or fibrinonecrotic uh, metritis. This is a pyometra. The bladder helps you to get orient. Here's the bladder. There's a vagina, cervix, and then we have the uterine horns distended with these tremendous amounts of uh, green, uh, yellowish, uh, pyogenic material. Uh, that's a very, very uncommon lesion, and, and it was caused by apyogenes. This is just a normal chorealantoic membrane with an incidental finding. So these chalky white areas are mineralized plaques. Okay, on top of the slide, we have a normal placenta. Uh, there's an amniotic sac, the chorealantoic membrane with the embryo in the middle. And pigs have individual placentas, so it is common to have normal fetuses and fetal alterations in the same litters. The embryo in the lower portion of the slide has been infected with porcine parvovirus, resulting in death of the embryo. Okay, there's another example of porcine parvovirus. Uh, this is a uterus with multiple intrauterine mummies. If porcine parvovirus infects fetuses in the first trimester, it will kill them and uh, it causes reabsorption of the embryos. If it infects uh, fetuses in the second trimester, it usually causes mummification. And in the third trimester, pigs will develop an immune response and clear the virus. The interesting thing about porcine parvovirus is that it affects uh, single fetuses and then moves slowly through the uterus. So you can have mummies of different sizes and even absolutely normal, perfectly normally born pigs in the same litter, as you can see on this slide. On this slide, I just want to show you some fresh and partially outlook ne near-term fetuses, which is, again, a characteristic presentation of PERS. That similar slide I showed you before with the center fetus having this nicotizing omphalitis. Uh, PERS uh, causes abortions uh, very late in gestation, so between uh, 109 and uh, 114, so 114 days, which is actually the normal gestation length. Uh, as I said before, abortions are much more common uh, of non infectious uh, or have not an infectious uh, uh, cause. If you end up with a litter, which has a variety of tiny little mummies, larger mummies, near-term fetuses, and some normal fetuses. Then an enterovirus should be your top differential. And the synonym for this condition is actually SMADY. So we have stillbirth, mummification, embryonic death, and infertility. This placenta came with an aborted fetus. And we have multifocal hemorrhages and ulcerations that can be caused by a variety of bacterial infections, which can include Streptococcus suis, E. coli, and others. It is very uncommon, occurs only sporadic. Brucella suis is very uncommon, but it should probably be included as a differential on this slide. This is a lung from an aborted fetus. And you can see in this one a purulent bronchopneumonia. That's a very uncommon lesion. This case was associated with nocardia asteroides. Okay, this is a more common fetal lesion, but it's still quite uncommon. And we have a multifocal nicotizing dermatitis that was caused by dermal mucormycosis. Differentials include streptomyces species and aspergillus. That's the ideal board slide because it tells you on the bottom that you had 400 parts per million of carbon monoxide causing this lesion. Uh, the sherry red color, as I said before, is classic for capoxy hemoglobinemia. Sows may actually not die, but the fetuses are more susceptible, so you only will have abortion uh, with this type of lesion. We move now on to the male genital tract. This is paraphimosis. 
So that's an exteriorized penis that the bore can't retract. Uh, if this is associated with secondary bacterial infections, we can have a fibrinonecrotic postitis. Uh, to tell you, uh, or to be able to tell you where this lesion, uh, uh, why actually this lesion most commonly occurs, I wanted to show you a drawing of the prepucium. Here's the prepucium with the antrum, and on the cranial portion of the antrum, we have this uh, uh, bilateral butterfly shaped prepucial diverticulum. These diverticles can become severely infected by mixed bacteria. So this is a prepucial diverticulitis. If you open it up, you can see this chronic necro-ulcerative prepucial diverticulitis. If this is a long-standing lesion, you can have either uh, occlusion or obstruction of the prepucial orifice, which can cause paraphimose, as I showed you before, or you can have a prepucial enlargement. Okay, this is a testicular enlargement due to a unilateral orchitis. Uh, the location of the testis predisposes uh, the testis uh, to wounds, especially lacerations, because boars tend to fight. If these lacerations occur, uh, you can have secondary bacterial infections, which then can result in a diffuse necrotizing orchitis, as on this slide. Uh, Brucella suez, in contrast, is very rare and would cause kind of a multifocal uh, testicular abscesses or granulomas. I don't have a slide of that. The last organ I want to talk about is, are the kidneys. Now, this is a multifocal fibrinohemorrhagic glomerulonephritis. Uh, in this case, it was caused by African swine fever, and you can see uh, the necrotic and hemorrhagic lymph node right here. However, differentials include African swine fever, classical swine fever, and bacterial septicemias like Salmonella corazuas, erysipelas, or Haemophilus parasuas. A disease we haven't talked about that also can cause icterus and hemoglobinuria. This is leptospirosis. Leptospira pomona is the most common isolate from swine. In general, most leptospiral infections in pigs are subclinical, acute lesions, are very nonspecific and icterus and the hemoglobinuria occur usually in pigs that are younger than three months of age. Uh, differential would include the salinomycin intoxication. In chronic cases, uh, leptospirosis lesions are usually confined to the kidneys and you can find a diffuse interstitial nephritis and multifocal renal cortical petechia. These are multifocal renal medullary abscesses. This lesion was found in a pig with the bacterial septicemia caused by Streptococcus suis. These are multifocal renal cortical abscesses, and that's due to an embolic nephritis caused by Arcanobacterium pyogenes. This is a lesion I showed you earlier with multiple renal infarcts that are most commonly caused by E. coli, you know, the infarct, or A. pyogenes. I showed you actually the other side of this kidney, the cortex, with some abscesses and the infarcts. A uh, very severe, diffuse bilateral pyelonephritis and pyourethritis. Uh, this can be caused by E. coli, Klebsiella, or Streptococcus species. Carinobacterium suis, which is now called Eubacterium suis, can also cause this lesion. Uh, Eubacterium suis can also cause cystitis and nephritis, and is a common cause of sudden death in sows. Here we just have an example of a chronic pyelonephritis radiating from the pelvis, and also urethritis. This is a kidney from a pig with kidney worms, Stephanurus dentatus. The worms are found in the cysts in the perirenal fat and sometimes in the kidneys. You can see it here. Uh, and they have fistulous openings to the pelvis. So we have multifocal parasitic cysts associated with fibrosis and interstitial nephritis. This is a kidney from a pig with vitamin D intoxication. I showed you other slides from this pig before. We have interconnecting areas of mineralization 
due to mineralization of the basement membranes. These whitey, this white shalky color should help you identify this lesion as diffuse renal mineralization. The kidney with uh, severe diffuse renal cortical fibrosis. The medulla is not involved and there is no radiating padding, pattern from the medulla. So the best differential would include mycotoxin and these are either citronine or ocratoxin. This is very severe uh, perirenal edema and I think there's only one slide uh, going around which everybody knows uh, and uh, the lesion is caused by pigweed amaranthus retroflexum so I decided to include a new slide with severe perirenal edema however this slide has a slight uh, uh, yellow discoloration so that also could be caused by a ruptured uh, ureter. However on cross-section of the kidney we could confirm our suspicion of pigweed intoxication and we have diffuse renal necrosis and hemorrhages. And that should end my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.